Hi, David. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, okay. Maybe I possibly do video. Sorry? No, I'm, I'm just asking to, to the organizers because I have the, my video is blocked. Okay. So yes, uh, to do yes. let me just open the video. Okay, great. Nice to meet you, David. So I will present you, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it must be a very uh, tense day to uh, to run this symposium because you, you're always relying on the technology to not let you down. Right. Yes, it's correct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but everything that could have gone wrong, it it, got, it went wrong. So now yeah. it's a, <laughs> yeah, in the morning. Yes, <laughs> yes, but uh, now it's okay. No, it's okay. Uh, yeah, don't, don't worry. You you turned it around and I think it only cost you 10 minutes. So. Uh, yeah, more or less, more or less. But it's done, it's, it's solved, so it's good. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've had to do all my teaching online this year and I've just had problem after problem after problem. Yeah, um, well... Um... Hopefully here the classes are back on track. So uh, yeah. now now we are more or less okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope that we will have everybody not yet there, but the other speakers. So no people are entering. So we will have Tiago not yet there. Yeah, the conference is only supposed to start at 2.30, so okay. uh, let's wait just a little bit longer, okay? Okay, yeah. sure.
So let's start. So John, okay. you can start. Thank you so much. See you soon. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. So my name is João Mano. I'm sharing this uh, afternoon session together with uh, João Borges. So we are both from University of Aveiro. So I will start by presenting uh, uh, our next invited speaker, which is Professor David Fulton from Newcastle University. So Professor Fulton received his PhD from the University of California at Los Angeles, working on carbohydrates and supermolecular chemistry. And then he returned to UK for a, a postdoc period at University of Durham before moving to his present position at Newcastle University in 2006, where he's a member of its functional materials and molecular molecules group. So its research interest is, uh, is quite broad, but uh, we could uh, uh, compartmentalize in supramolecular and synthetic polymer chemistry in the in broad sense. But today, Professor David Fulton will speak uh, to us about polymers and materials from the air of bacteria. So this is really within the core of a very interesting and emergent field uh, that interfaces with biology, chemistry, and material science, which is related, I believe, with, uh, with living materials. I just have a look on the abstracts, but I believe that it's, it, it should, we could consider that it's really about that. So we are... We are looking forward to see your presentation. So you can start whenever you wish. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Um, before starting, I'd, I'd like to thank the organizers um, very much for the, the opportunity to, to present today. I was very, very much looking forward to this meeting happening in person. Not, not, not just because it looked like a, a very beautiful part of the world, but because it seems to be um, an incredibly professional and well-run meeting. And I, I know how much time and energy it takes to, to pull these sorts of meetings together. So I think the, the organizing committee have, have done a, a really great job. And for, for that reason alone, I felt very privileged to uh, be invited to attend. Anyway, let me tell you a story which um, I've been involved with at Newcastle, which has developed over the last five or six years. And, and, and this is around the, the, the idea of, of um, trying to, to use polymers and develop material which are, are made by bacteria. Now, um, humans have been using fibers produced by living organisms to make materials pretty much since the, the, the dawn of time. So you'll be familiar with things like cotton and, and wool, which are used to make materials. Um, and you might think as an academic scientist that, that this has all been pretty well explored. And, 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 and I think you'd be right, but, but there is one class of, of living organism which makes fibers that, that we haven't really started to think about. And, and, and that, that's bacteria. You find that, that, that there are many gram-negative bacteria which, which produce fibers called fimbri or, or pili, depending on the, the, the literature that you read. And he, he, here's an electron micrograph image that I've taken off Google. This is a, an E. coli bacterium. And if, if you look around the periphery of the, the bacterium, you can see these wiry, hair-like fibers. And the, 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 these fibers have evolved very unique structural and mechanical properties that provide advantages to the, the bacterium, which, which allow it to, to survive. It's pretty easy to culture bacteria now. There will be a lot of advances in synthetic biology, which will allow you to, to, to do that and, and to make these fibers and harvest these fibers in, in quantity. So, so, so this sort of raises the, the, the question, can, can you actually do anything useful with these fibers? Can you make materials from them? Can you exploit the, the unique properties of the fibers? And can you ultimately use them to, to do useful things? And I, th I, th I think this is a, a largely unanswered question at this point in time, which as a scientist is something I get very excited about. It's, 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 it's incredibly hard to find fields which 
aren't well established and are incredibly busy. But here's something that there's there's not so much going on. So um, it's it's nice to be involved with something which is is fairly new. Now the the, the system I'm going to tell you about today is um, called Capsular Antigen Fragment One, or you'll hear me call it CAF One. And this is a fiber which is produced in nature by a bacterium called Yersinia pestis, which is a bacterium which, which causes bubonic plague, which is still a, a problem in the world today, but of course wiped out about a third of the, the European population in, in the Middle Ages. And um, calf ones, uh, it's, it's evolved a, a structure which helps Yersinia pestis evade detection by the immune system. So this is an electron micrograph. It's, it's actually from E. coli bacterium, not a Yersinia pestis bacterium, but it's, it's been genetically engineered to produce the same fibers that Yersinia pestis produces. And um, if you look at these fibers, they're very, very different in nature to the ones that we've seen in the previous page, which were made by E. coli. Now, that, that, this is a, a photo of my colleague, um, Jeremy Lakey, who works in the Newcastle Biosciences Institute. And Jeremy actually got working on CAF1 and Yersinia pestis well over a decade ago through a collaborative project with the UK's Ministry of Defence, which is all about um, developing better vaccines for bubonic plague, because there are some nations in the world which still um, have biological weapons and bubonic plague is, is probably one of them. So, so Jeremy spent quite a bit of time just learning about CAF1. And if you look at this um, electron micrograph of, of, of a, a single strand of CAF1, you can see it's, it's very different from those made by E. coli. It's, it's a long, thin fiber. It can easily be one or two microns long. And if you zoom in a little bit closer, Excuse me, I just need to move the bar with the speaker's heads around because it has a tendency to be on the page where I want to look. If, if, if you look a little bit closer at the, the structure, you can see it's actually made up of, of individual protein subunits. And based on electron micrographs and little bits that were known about crystal structures, Jeremy was able to piece together the, the structure of, of the CAF1 polymer. It's based upon 15 kilodalton monomeric subunits, and, and each one of these subunits has, has two parts to it. It's got a, a long, thin end terminal donor strand, and it's got a, a hydrophobic acceptor cleft. And the polymer's made when you take the end terminal donor strand of one subunit, in this case, the, the yellow subunit, and that's donated into the empty hydrophobic acceptor cleft of the adjacent subunit in, in, in the polymer chain. And that, that, what, what that forms is, is, is a really well-known motif to the structural biologist called an immun, immunoglobulin-like fold, which is essentially, it's, it's like a, a sandwich of beta sheets. So stuck around a, a very hydrophobic core. So it's, it's a very, very stable structure. Um, but I, th I think what's maybe more interesting is, is something Jeremy noticed about the structure of CAF1. And this was it possessed structural similarities with a protein called fibronectin. Fibronectin is also a protein of immune, immunoglobulin-like folds. And it's a very, very important protein because it's an extracellular matrix protein. So before we can get any further, I just need to tell you a little bit about extracellular matrices or ECMs. So ECMs are networks of proteins or polysaccharides that sort of anchor live cells within their, their microenvironments. And if you look at this cartoon that I've stolen off Google, you can see here a, a single mammalian cell. It's surrounded by extracellular matrix. And the cell doesn't just sit there within the matrix, it interacts with the matrix. The cell has these red colored proteins on its surface called integrins. And integrins bind on to biochemical cues, which are contained within the, the, the extracellular matrix. And, and when these binding events happen, it triggers, triggers signaling pathways within the cells that make the cells behave 
in, in, in the right sort of way. And I always find cells are a bit like people. They need to be in the right sort of micro environments to, 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 to flourish. And if they, 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 they have the right things around them, they will be happy. But if they have the wrong things around them or they have nothing, then they're probably not going to be happy and they're not going to behave in the way that you, you might want them to do. So, so, so why does that matter? Well, there's a, a huge demand for artificial ECMs in, in cell culture applications. This is really big, important business. So you've got things like your, your tissue engineering, which could be making artificial organs, things around regenerative medicine, which really involve taking a person's stem cells and, and making them do, th do things which might make them better. Toxicology screening, drug testing, I want to do these on, on cells which more closely model tumours. The, the, the key to being able to make artificial ECMs is, is to find the right sort of microenvironment so that cells will flourish and behave in the way that you want them to, 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 to be. Now, th th there's a lot of cell lines that will culture on plastic. This is very well known. But if you want to culture things which are more exotic, things which are really important in moving these fields along, the current go-to ECM is, is something called Matrigel. And Matrigel is a real witch's brew product. It's, it's derived from mouse sarcoma cells. For, for this bottle of Matrigel, you probably need about the material from about 20 mice. And because it's come from an animal that has zero clinical potential, so it's a very complex, largely unknown mixture of very variable composition. And that, that, that can actually lead to batch-to-batch -batch reproducibility issues where people can get the cells to culture with one batch, but they can't get them to do the same thing when they, when they change to a different batch of Matrigel. And, and, and also the, over the last decade or so, there's been an increasing awareness of the importance of of mechanical properties in cell culture. And cells are very, very tuned into how hard or soft their microenvironment is. And if that's not of the right hardness or softness, it can, can affect how the cells behave. So it's important that we can make artificial ECMs where we can also tune the mechanical properties. And you can't really do that with Matrigel. So we need stuff which is, is better than Matrigel and Matrigel-like products. So the, the, the similarity of CAF1 to, to fibronectin hints that it might be useful as an extracellular matrix. And I'm going to come back and talk about CAF1 in cell culture. But before we do that, I want to talk to you about CAF1 as, as a supramolecular polymer. So you have a look at this interaction that holds the monomer units into the chain. You've got, you've got what, what is an incredibly strong interaction. It's got an association constant of at least 10 to the 14 reciprocal molarities. I suspect it's a couple of orders of magnitude larger than that. So also it's a kinetically very inert interaction. I, as a supramolecular chemist, think of, of supramolecular interactions being fast on, fast off, things that are very, very dynamic. This is the absolute opposite. The rate of dissociation here is on the, the geological time scale. That, that this interaction is so tight that it'll probably dissociate about once every 100 million years. As a supramolecular chemist, that's really, really unusual. You, you don't see things often which are so strong and so inert. It's very different. CAF1 is very different to other well-known supramolecular polymers. If you think of this stuff that's been made by people like Bert Meyer, they're very, very dynamic. The, the monomers are held together through quite labile interactions. They're, they're inherently unstable. This is very different. In many ways, it's actually better to think of this not necessarily as a supramolecular polymer, but more like a conventional covalent polymer where the monomers are linked together through covalent interactions. What, what, what we found out about CAF1 is it's actually a lot more supramolecular than it first appears in, in, a, in a rather unusual way. I, I, I never knew much about proteins in, until I started to work on this project. But what I learned quickly is that proteins, when you heat them up, they, they can unfold and they can unfold and lose their well-defined tertiary structures. 
Sometimes this um, process can be reversible, but very often it's an irreversible process. And I guess the classic example of thermal unfolding in the irreversible sense is when you take an egg and you boil it, when you cool that egg down, it doesn't go back to where it started. And the reason is because of the proteins inside the egg have, have unfolded and then they can't refold again. So what we discovered about the CAF1 polymer quite by chance is yeah, you can heat it up. And when it heats up, it will unfold and, and depolymerize. But more importantly than that, when you cool it down, it will refold and repolymerize back into the, the polymer again. So let's have a look at that in a little bit more detail. So here is a, a cartoon structure of, of what we call native CAF1. Native just means it's made by the bacteria and it's, it's a long thin polymer. We can take that in solution, we can heat it up, we can melt it. And the, the, the figure here is a little bit un misleading, I think. But what's really happening, if, I can, if you can look at my hands here, you're, you're, when you heat it up, you're causing the subunit to unfold and the subunit is no longer complementary to the donor strand. So, so that interaction just disappears and the polymer falls apart. What happens when you cool it down is this subunit wants to refold again and it wants to refold again around an adjacent donor strand to reform the polymer. And if you look at this process in the SDS page gel, you can see this is over four hours. This band here represents the, the monomer. And you can see with time, this band's getting fainter, which suggests the monomer's, monomer's being consumed. And these bands for higher oligomers are starting to become darker. And you can see we're moving to, to higher oligomers, higher molecular weight. When you have a look at what we call refolded calf, so this is a polymer which has gone through a cycle of melting and then refolding. You can, you can see the, the, the polymer chains by electron microscopy. And the, 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 these chains tend to be shorter than what you started with. So there's something going on there that makes the, the, the polymers shorter. And I can't remember if I'm going to talk about it in this talk, we'll see. But it's an important point to um, take home that what we make is shorter than what we started with. Now, the, 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 this reversible unfolding of CAF1 was, was really quite an unexpected discovery. And it was one that as a chemist, I got excited about because it presents new synthetic possibilities that as a chemist, you, you, you get excited about. So the first thing that we can do to sort of explore those synthetic possibilities is, is make copolymers. And if you want to make copolymers, then you're going to have to expand your power of, of monomers. And th 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 this was actually fairly easy to do with CAF1. CAF1 is very amenable to mutagenesis. And wh wh what I mean by that is you can actually engineer the bacterium at the molecular level. You can change, it, change its genome, you can change its DNA. To, to change how some of the, the proteins are expressed. And what, what, what you can find if you look at the structure of CAF1 is there's various loops and there's the donor strand. And we found it's actually quite easy to do um, amino acid substitutions or amino acid insertions to insert interest in biologically relevant peptide motifs into the CAF1 structure to hardwire them in there. We've made a whole bunch of these. This is only some of them, but the one I'm going to focus on today is RGDS. And if any of you have ever worked in biomaterials, you, you'll know all about RGDS. It's a very, very well-known peptide motif that's involved in, in cell adhesion. So making copolymers is really easy. You have a wild-type polymer made by the bacteria. You have a genetically engineered polymer expressing this RGDS motif within loop five, I think. You melt both of these in solution, you mix them together, you cool them down, and you can make copolymers where you can control the composition just by tuning the composition of, of, of the polymers that, that, that you're using to mix together. I'll come back to the, the, the significance of, of why this is important a little bit later on.
The, 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 the other thing that you get is if, if you make hydrogels out of CAF1, the, the, this capacity the polymer has to depolymerize and then repolymerize again is also sort of transferred into the, the hydrogel network. Hydrogels are easy to make with CAF1. CAF1 has some reactive lysine residues on the, on the protein. And if you add in multi-arm pegs, which have activated ester functional groups, they'll react with the, the amines on the CAF1 to form cross-linked gels. We call these native gels because they're, they're made from the, the polymer that the bacteria makes. You can then take these gels, you can heat them, and they will melt into solution. Then if you leave that solution to cool at room temperature, over the course of an hour or so, it will reset to, to reform a gel. And that, that gel is a little bit different from the one that we, we, we started with. It tends to be less stiff than the one we started with, probably because these polymer chains that we've made are, are shorter than the ones that we started with. But the, 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 this is really quite unexpected behavior for, for, for a hydrogel, for a chemically cross-linked hydrogel. When you think about chemically cross-linked materials, you usually can't break them apart and put them back together again. Yeah, you can do it with a physical hydrogel where the components are held together by weak non-covalent ones, but it's not something that you would anticipate that you can do with a, with a, a chemically cross-linked gel. So the, the, this reversible unfolding property of the CAF1 allows us to make copolymers and in, in meltable hydrogels. And, and the, the, these are things that we can now take back into, into cell culture. We can show these as supramolecular features are, are actually allowing us to do something useful. So I, I was very keen that we try and assess the, the, the potential of CAF1 as a, an artificial extracellular matrix. And we started to work with a cell line called human dermal fibroblasts. And the, 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 these are the most abundant cell type within all of the body's connective tissues. They're, they're really there to secrete components of, of ECM, such as collagen. And, and, and that, 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 that's a good thing because if, it's, if the cells are doing that, then you can tell they're happy. You can tell that they're in the right microenvironment. So this sort of sensitivity they have to their microenvironment actually makes them good candidates for, for testing new hydrogels, even though there, there aren't really significant issues in, in culturing this particular cell line. You can grow it in plastic if you want. So, so, so the process of cell culture is pretty easy. You make, a, you make a hydrogel. You can add cells on top of the hydrogel and culture them. Or a little bit later on, I'll show you how you can actually get cells into the hydrogel by exploiting that meltable feature. So apologies for the, the little change in, in cartoons. I'm trying to improve my uh, drawing skills to, to make better cartoons, and I haven't quite done it all for this talk yet, but I am getting there. Anyway, what have we done here? Um, we've, we've made a, a, a native CAF1 wild type hydrogel. And this is what it looks like under the microscope when you have cells on it. The little green dots here are cells. They're just sat on this, this hydrogel. They're not really doing anything. And, and, and after a bit of time, they, they turn red, which means that they're dying. And the reason they're dying is because they're not happy. There's nothing in that microenvironment to stimulate them. There's no signals to say, right, do this, do that, proliferate, grow, metabolize. There's none of that going on. But if we do the same experiment, and this time we use one of our copolymers, and this is a copolymer which has an equimolar composition of the wild type and the RGDS modified monomer, things are very different. You can see here that the cells are they're green again. They're, they're starting to proliferate there are more cells with time. And what that's telling you is that the cells can recognize this RGDS peptide motif that's been hardwired into the CAF1 polymer structure. And that, that, that motif is telling the cells to start to proliferate and do things. They're happy, they're flourishing. And I, I think it's interesting as well that 
what we find is that the copolymers of wild type in RGDS actually perform better than when you have a polymer which has just got purely RGDS motifs in it. It's probably something around to do with the having too high a density of the RGDS peptide motif is, is a bad thing and diluting it down is, is, is actually making the cells happier. So, so that ability we, we have to make copolymers is, is turning out to look pretty useful. Another thing you can do here is you can look for more sophisticated signals that cells are happy, so you can stain your cells. The red colour here is, is what's called F-actin, so this is a cytoskeleton. The cells only make that when they're happy, when they're in the right sort of microenvironment. And over here, a cell's been stained green, a collection of cells have been stained green. This shows the presence of collagen. Like I said, this cell line, they're only going to make collagen when they're in the right sort of microenvironment. So, so the observations we've made here suggest that when the cells are on top of the hydrogels, they're responding to the RGDS motifs within the network, they're displaying their normal behaviours, and that's a good thing. And we can see that in some other tests that I'm not going to talk about here. When you look at their, their ability to make DNA, when you look at their metabolic activities, they're better when RGDS is present, and it seems to be better when RGDS is diluted within the, the copolymer compared to the pure. RGDS polymers. I also find that the refolded gels actually work better than the native hydrogels. And what we find is that this is probably something to do with the native, the, the refolded hydrogels being more viscoelastic. So it's easier for the cells to remodel their environment. They can go, they can push chains out of the way to make space to, 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 to grow. Whereas when, when the network's very elastic, it's hard for the cells to push these chains out of the way because the chains start to push back onto the cells. And, and, and that, that, that sort of observation agrees with what we've been reading in the literature from people like David Mooney at Harvard who, who say viscoelasticity is actually an important thing and, and soft can actually sometimes be, be better for, for certain cells. Now, I said that we can do 3D cell culture, and I, th I think this is really quite cool. Um, 3D cell culture has become an increasingly important in, in the world of cell culture. Why is that? Well, two, growing cells in 2D is just not representative of the native environment in which cells grow. They grow in 3D environments mostly. If you want to be able to study that, then you need ways to encapsulate cells inside a hydrogel. But that, that, that can be difficult because a lot of cross-linking chemistry that would conventionally be used to do that sort of thing can be toxic to cells. There's been a big drive to develop bio-orthogonal bio cross-linking chemistries, but yeah, the, the, these can be expensive and they require chemical expertise. It's good if you've got a, an organic chemist in your team, but as I've learned, a lot of cell biologists don't have that expertise, and so they need things which, which are easier for them to do. What we find is that with CAF1 hydrogel, cell encapsulation is easy. So we can take a preformed hydrogel, we can melt it by heating it, we can then cool it down and quickly add cells to it, and then allow the gel to set. And what, what, what we find is that we get a, a homogeneous encapsulation of the cells throughout the hydrogel. You can tell us if you look at the, the, the cells within the hydrogel with a confocal microscope. And if you look a little bit more closely with the confocal microscope, you can see the cells are making these cytoskeleton networks and they're proliferating and they're, they're increasing their metabolic activities. So, so what, what, what this is telling us is that this supramolecular feature of CAF1 that we didn't know existed actually seems to have potential power in, in cell culture to, to, to allow people to do 3D cell culture in a way that avoids a lot of more complex chemistry. Just thinking about sort of material things that you can do with these, well, there's so a lot of work done with hydrogels, which are physical hydrogels. So the components are held together by weak, non-covalent interactions. But people would prefer to work with chemically cross-linked hydrogels. They, 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 they're physically more robust. 
And you, you don't have to worry about things like erosion, where bits of your hydrogel are just going to slowly diffuse away and your hydrogel will slowly dissolve. Chemically cross-linked hydrogels are, are better, but they present material challenges. If you take a chemically cross-linked network, you can't easily change its shape. Another thing with a chemical cross-linked network is if you cut it in two or you damage it in any way, it won't heal when you put it back together again. But the, the, the sort of capacity of the CAF1 polymer to, to melt and then reform allows us to address the, 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 those challenges. So this is a, a CAF1 hydrogel, which has been stained blue just so that you can see it. And you can take that CAF1 hydrogel, you can break it up with a spatula, you can melt it, and then you can pour it into a different shape mold to, and cool it down to, to, to make a cube when you started off with a cylinder. So you can change the, the shape, no problem. This is a, a hydrogel which has been chopped in two. One half's been stained blue, the other half stained red. If you hold these together, they'll, they'll, never, they'll, they'll never glue. They'll, they'll always fall apart. But what we can do is we can melt the faces. So what we've done is put them on top of a metal spatula, which is on top of a hot plate. It just melts the CAF1 protein on that face. We can then hold the two faces together, leave them to set for an hour or so, and you've got a strong enough weld there that the, you, you can pick the hydrogel up by one single segment. Now, another thing we can do is we can take two preformed hydrogel materials we can melt them, we can mix them, we can cool them to form a new hydrogel material, which has a sort of intermediate mechanical strength to the two that we started with. So that's a, that's a cool way where if you've got a, a small pallet of pre-formed hydrogels, you can use them to actually dial up a, a whole bunch of, of hydrogels with different mechanical properties. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap up now and I, I usually don't like to to speculate in, in talks, but I, I want to just actually finish this one up with a bit of a speculative slide. As, as, as a chemist, I, I was very interested in the mechanism of how CAF1 polymerizes. We take it, we melt it, we form subunits, and then these subunits come together to, to reform polymer chain. And the, the sort of donor acceptor nature of the, the subunit with this donor strand and its acceptor cleft suggests very much to me that CAF1 was probably polymerizing by a step growth mechanism. The step growth mechanism is one of the two fundamental mechanisms of, of polymerization. You can see here in this cartoon, the monomers are sort of coming together in a stepwise fashion to form small oligomers, which then come together to form bigger oligomers and eventually polymers. Stepwise polymerization is how polymers like nylon, polyester are made. It's a very important mechanism of, of polymerization. We, we, we've done a lot of work to try and actually look at the, the mechanism of polymerization. And I'm only going to show you a tiny bit of it. And this was experiments that were done, uh, small angle X-ray scattering experiments that were done at the, the Diamond Light Source, which actually allowed us to follow the the evolution of the polymer as it grows with time. Polymer chemists normally talk about molecular weight, but here it's, it's more convenient to talk about the average number of polymer units in the chain. And you can see from the SAC studies, um, it goes up quite fast over an hour or so, and then very, very quickly slows down. And the, 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 the black trace here is actually one of these, the red trace isn't. But what I want to say here is if this were a step growth polymerization, a plot of the average number of subunits in the chain versus time should be linear over the entire time course of the polymerization. Wallace Carruthers found this out um, what, about 90 years ago. But what we found here is that CAF1 is actually only consistent with the step growth polymerization in the first hour or so of, of the polymerization process. You can see there's a reasonably good linearity here, but then of course, boom, it's deviating. 
And, and that significant deviation from linearity suggests that there's an alternative pathway which might start to dominate the latter part of the process. An important thing to think about this latter part of the process is the concentration of monomer is a lot lower here because already a lot of the monomers have been consumed into, into polymer chains. So those monomers that are left find themselves at a much lower concentration than, than what they were at the start of the process. So I think that's got something to do in, in, with, with what's happening. And what I actually suspect, and I, I, I say suspect or, or hint because I don't know for sure, I'm sort of sticking my neck out a little bit here, that what's actually happening in the latter part of this process is a chain growth mechanism which can maybe happen when we have a sort of low concentration of, of, of monomer around them. In a chain growth polymerization, what happens is somehow there's a spontaneous initiation event, and then monomers will sequentially grow on to the end of the, the, the growing chain. So this, this would be things how like vinyl monomers polymerize, things like polystyrene, polyethyl methacrylate are made. Now, the, the, this idea that the, the CAF1 monomer can actually polymerize by a chain growth mechanism is maybe not so, as crazy as it, it sounds because there's a lot of work being done to study how this class of protein, this class of protein actually called a chaperone usher proteins. These fibers are all chaperone usher proteins. And what that means is that the bacteria are actually using chaperones and ushers to help make the fibers at the surface of the bacteria. And I'm hoping you can see this YouTube video. This, this is made by Gabriel Wakesman, who, who works in London, and he's studied the biogenesis of these kinds of polymers for a long time now. And if we go to about here, um, I'm just gonna pause it. Okay, so you can see the polymer chain growing outside of the outer membrane. And there is an usher protein in here. It's just the donut shaped ring that the polymer is going through. And down at the bottom here, this is the head of the polymer where monomer units are going to get brought along by chaperones and, and, and pushed and joined onto the head of the polymer chain. This is how the bacteria makes the polymer. And I have a suspicion that we're actually able to do this in a test tube without the use of the chaperone and the usher. And the reason why I'm so excited about that is because in the, over the last quarter of a century, the synthetic polymer community has dedicated a significant amount of its effort to develop chain growth polymerizations, to, to learn how to make polymers in a very, very controlled way. And if we can do this with protein polymers, then I think that's a, a real significant advancement in the field of protein polymers and materials and then protein nanotechnology. So I'll wrap up here um, and just thank the person who did most of this work, who was Dr. Hema Dura, who um, is now a junior academic at Castilla La Mancha in Spain. I want to thank my colleague Jeremy Lakey for getting me into all of this and Dan Peters, Helen Waller, especially Helen, who gave me lots of CAF1 without asking questions, and Alex for running the, the SACS experiments for me, and my collaborators in the School of Engineering, uh, Maria and Marina Ferraia, who is Portuguese, and thank you to Innovate UK for the funding, and thank you for your time today. Cheers. Thank you very much, Professor Fulton. So it was a very interesting presentation on trying on using this kind of calf uh, proteins that you can genetically engineering in order to use as monomers to prepare huge supramolecular systems. So very, very, very interesting. So we will have time for uh, one or two questions. So I don't know if anybody would like to start. I, I could start a bit. So in terms of the strength of the bond so that you that you have between the models, between the, yeah. the, the, the proteins. So the strength is enough, for example, to for example, to inject. So can you by shear the hydrogels to break these bonds in order to have like injectable or tixotropic kind of systems? Um yes and no. 
um, the, 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 you cannot break the bonds um, in, unless you heat it up to, to, to the melting temperature. So when you heat it up, you're, you're doing this and the bond breaks because it's not complementary anymore. But you'll never do that. Never. Okay. This is such a strong interaction that it's, it's evolved to be strong. The reason it's evolved to be strong is that some bacteria use these polymer chains as, as anchors and, and they anchor themselves to, to, to maybe tissue surfaces. And if there is a single weak link in that polymer chain, then the anchor is broken. They cannot afford for, for one of these interactions to break. So I, th I think even th that's the evolutionary reason why this bond is so strong. It's, it's, it's probably one of the strongest interactions known in all of biology. Coming back to the question, will, will it shear thin? The, the very, very weak hydrogels will shear thin. When there's a very, very small amount of cross-linking, they will shear thin okay. because they're, they're conformationally very flexible. And so okay. as you apply the shear, the, 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 the gel will, will shear thin. But the ones which are more stiff, they are too cross-linked to shear thin. And, and they behave, let's say, more like... Um, uh, I mean, they're, they're not as stiff as rubbers. They're not nearly that stiff, but but they're, they're, you can do the same things with them. Very, very nice. So do, do you know already the sequence of the peptides that will do this kind of uh, very strong uh, one? Yeah, we, 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 we know a lot about this because these things are, are known at the genetic level. Okay. And there's a lot of work being done on chaperone usher proteins. Um, very, mostly chaperone usher proteins made by E. coli, the, the, the sort of wiry ones. There's been less done in the ones made by, by Yersinia pestis. Um, but um, yeah, a, a lot's known at the genetic level. A, a lot of these bacterial fimbri are here. We only know them at the genetic level. We can see them in the genome of bacteria, but we don't know why the bacteria make them. We don't know anything about their structures, their properties, what they might be useful for. So, so I, I feel there's now this huge undiscovered area of, of these materials, which have been around for a very, very long time. And we're only just starting to, 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 to look at them and wonder what we might be able to do with them. Okay, so thank you very I, I have uh, much more questions, but we, of course, we don't have time. I don't know if anybody would like to have a very Maybe quick... I would like to make a, a question, okay. if I may. So thank you very much, Professor David, for this great talk. So my question goes to the... You talked about the uh, reversibility of the system as well as the comparison between the chemical cross-link and the physical cross-link. So can we integrate both? How customizable is this system so to direct to different kind of uh, uh, tissue, cells, and... So um, we, we've done a little bit of work to put CAF1 into alginate gels. So al alginate gels are you know, incredibly well known. Um, I'm sure some of you um, in the audience know all about alginate gels. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can easily take alginate gels and use that as a, as a really low cost chassis in which you can put CAF1 chains. And, and we were interested in that sort of system because it's a cheap way to have a gel, which is a lot cheaper than using the CAF1 protein on its own. And certainly in the little bit of cell culture work we've done there, that we've got good evidence that the cells, even though they're mostly surrounded by alginate, can recognize the peptide motifs that are within the, the CAF1 polymers. So that, that, that's the only examples we have of, of, of let's say, a, a hybrid system. But um, I really would like to try and do more there. I intuitively feel there's, there's a lot more to explore. Okay, thank you very much. I also had a few more questions, but due to the, to the time, uh, so we have to move on. So thank you again for this uh, great talk. Um, so now I am pleased to um, introduce the, uh, the next speaker. So we'll have now, um, for oral communications, I'd like to remind the, the colleagues that uh, um, everyone has uh, 20, 12 uh, uh, minutes of talk plus three minutes for questions. So please, I ask the audience to please post your questions in the, in the chat on YouTube. Um, so uh, the first speaker is uh, um, Tiago uh, Moreira from uh, um, 
Faculdade de Ciência e Tecnologia na Universidade Nova um, de Lisboa. And uh, Tiago will be talking about uh, enhanced electrochromic performance using water dispersible poly three exal uh, thiophene nanoparticles. So Tiago, when you are ready, please, the virtual floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you see the slides? Can you hear me well? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay. So, um, thank you for your introduction. Uh, I will be presenting uh, enhanced electrochromic performances using water dispersible P3HT nanoparticles. And just as a quick uh, motivation, uh, the, my cover, the cover of my presentation is a, a sage glass building in the United States that is fully covered with uh, electrochromic uh, windows. So this is a bit of a motivation for, to, for what I'm going to present after. So, um, I'm a PhD student from the CHARM group, Cultural Heritage uh, and Responsive Materials in uh, Monte Caparica, that belongs to Nova School of Science and Technology. The group has uh, uh, five main areas, but I would like to highlight the last, design and develop of, of chromogenic materials, which is the area which I work in. Also, parallel to my PhD, we are working in collaboration with several partners uh, belonging to the Infusion European project. So, the group uh, uh, CHARM works with the chromogenic materials that respond to external stimuli. One of the examples is thermochromic materials that, in this case, respond to temperature. When it's cold, it goes red, it goes back to te uh, room temperature, or heat goes back to uh, uncolored state photochromic materials that respond to light and electrochromic materials that I will uh, talk that respond to a potential stimuli. So electrochromism can be defined as a visible and reversible color change associated to an electrochemical induced redox reaction. Basically, it's a material that changes color upon application, one color in the reduced state, another color in the oxidized state. There are several uh, families, if we can call it, of uh, electrochromic materials. Tungsten oxide, it's very well known, very studied. Ionic liquids, metal complexes as the Prussian blue, one of the first, and semiconductive polymers, which is the family of materials which I work in. That are semiconductive polymers that possess one color in the reduced state and one color in the oxidized state. So having the semiconductive polymers, they are processable in solvents, um, mostly toxic organic solvents, but I will talk that in a bit. And we can build electrochromic devices. Here you can see on the left, uh, there's a structure of an electrochromic device. That's a sandwich type of structure because the top layer and the bottom are the same. With a protective layer, that can be plastic or glass, and electrodes for conductivity, the electrochromic layer, and then an electrolyte to make the diffusion of the ions. These uh, um, electrochromic devices can have several applications, such as uh, glasses, mirrors for cars and airplanes, and electrochromic devices can be applicable just as a simple stimuli for, for the eye that Invisible has been exploring and collaborating with us to extend the, the, the number of applications for these devices. So still about the semiconductive polymers that I work in um, has been a, a great effort, especially from the group of Reynolds um, in the United States to make uh, uh, structural changes in order to achieve all the colors of the color palette for in numerous applications. However, most of these polymers are processable in uh, toxic organic solvents such as chloroform. Their redox switching times is not uh, they are a bit slow and also durability can be improved. And this is where we come in by producing nanoparticles dispersions in water from semiconductive polymers. In this case, we use the P3HT polymer, which is a very well-known polymer uh, also in nanoparticles, but we are exploiting the electrochromic activity. So we make nanoparticles uh, with this polymer and compare the electrochromic devices with the pure polymer. So we use uh, the um, nanoprecipitation method to uh, produce uh, the nanoparticles. We grab the P3HT. We have a good solvent, in this case is the THF, that we inject in a non-solvent water. 
and understeering nano particles are formed uh, and have this uh, kind of uh, reddish uh, dispersion. We filter to in order to exclude um, the rest of the polymer that does not form nanoparticles, have a pure dispersion, and then we characterize this uh, very stable water dispersion by DLS, SEM, and AFL. Here is a quick example of uh, uh, the formation of the nanoparticles by injecting THF with the, the, um, the polymer into water under steering, and we are able to control the size of the nanoparticles from 100 to 400 nanometers with great precision. And then we characterize again these nanoparticles by SEM and the FM measurements to have these uh, nice pictures and confirm the size, of course. So having these uh, dispersions of nanoparticles, the next step is to produce the uh, so-called electrochromic devices. We use these dispersions to spray cast in uh, plastic or glass. In this case, we used plastic to exploit these uh, performances and we produced an electrochromic device that switches from 1.5 to minus 1.5 and changes from red to the blue color. I would like to highlight that the reduced state, we always think we take into account the center square of the device. Having devices of P3HT nanoparticles and P3HT, we are now going to compare their performance. And there are four big uh, type of characterizations that we do to these uh, polymers and nanoparticles. Color contrast, to um, observe which is the color, color contrast of the devices from the reduced and the oxidized state at a specific wavelength. The redox switching speed, that is the time that the, the, the polymer or nanoparticles takes from the oxidized to the reduced and the reduced to the oxidized. Their durability and coloration efficiency. What is uh, the coloration efficiency? Is um, to calculate if the charge that is being consumed from the device is being used uh, to change color of the polymer or nanoparticles, or if it is being used to other secondary processes which will decrease the coloration efficiency. So we have here two graphs. The on the left is a P3HT thin film and the nanoparticles, and we can see that the contrast is bigger on the nanoparticles by applying the same voltage for the same time which means that the transmissive state of the nanoparticles device is much higher. So we have a more uh, transparent oxidized state. Here we have the figures of merit and the four um, characteristics uh, for the, 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 the device, color contrast, reduction time, oxidation time, and coloration efficiency. They are better comparing nanoparticles to the thin film. Afterwards, we go to um, test the durability of these devices. So what we do is apply minus 1.5 and 1.5 volts for 1,000 cycles, and then we check the durability. So if there is an increase or decrease or degradation of the polymer among the 1,000 cycles. And as we can see on the right, we have the increase of the color contrast of the nanoparticles when comparing with the thin film. So there is an increase of performance of the P3 HD nanoparticles comparing with the polymer. We wanted to go a bit further just to make sure that we were not having any kind of, uh, kind of artifacts from the characterization, from the durability test, sorry. And again, after the, in, after the 1000 cycles, we did again a characterization of the device with nanoparticles and with the P3 HD film. And we see again an uh, increase of contrast. So the increase that was before is not an artifact, it maintains that performance and the nanoparticles have a bigger contrast as well as a faster switching time for reduction and oxidation. In this case, we have even a bigger contrast comparing from the beginning that we can see here that now has a 34% of uh, transmittance between the reduced and the oxidized state comparing with the thin film that is half of the transmittance. Here is a short video after the 1000 cycles, which means that the device is already a bit degraded, but it's clear that the device on the left, that is the nanoparticles, have a bigger contrast when you take into account the working electrodes in the center. So now it's going to oxidize after a few seconds and you can see that the oxidized state of nanoparticles is more transmissive 
than the polynomial. Having this, uh, uh, these results that we, we found it uh, great, uh, we wanted to go a bit further. And as I said, there's been a great effort on exploiting and uh, increasing the color palette of these colors. And since we have dispersions working in water, we now want to go to colors that are not so common uh, for electrochromic materials. And we made a synthetic effort to synthesize yellow polymers that are rather hard to synthesize because uh, there are, uh, there's a synthetic effort that needs to be made and uh, 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 breaking conjugations of the polymers. Uh, and we were able to synthesize four shades of yellow that are, of course, electrochromic. And we did the same study and we produced nanoparticles of these polymers. And we check again the same type of results we observe with the P3HD nanoparticles. Again, a short video just to show you. Now, in this case, the nanoparticles are on the right. And this is again after 1000 cycles. So the performance of both is not the best, but the nanoparticles work better. They have a better durability. They have increased performance after this uh, uh, cycling experiment. And this is also a publication that was accepted last month. Again, uh, um, to conclude, uh, we of course uh, increase a lot the, 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 the projection of this uh, uh, type of work just by avoiding toxic organic solvents because we are now using dispersions in water. We produce these devices by a facile deposition method as spray casting that is uh, easy, easily scalable to inkjet printing for industrial use. That's a great uh, props. And um, uh, we uh, have enhanced electrochromic performance using nanoparticles of these semiconductive polymers. And we hope that we trigger, trigger new industrial processes in the field of printed electronics, increasing the color palette using our uh, nanoparticle formation methods. So um, in the end, we, uh, we can say with a lot of certainty that water dispersion of polyethylene nanoparticles are strong and viable uh, as electrochromic inks for uh, industrial applications. Uh, I, I would like to thank the, um, my supervisors from NOVA, Professor Cesar and Professor George, the staff from Invisible and Many Technology in Italy, the organization of PICAM, and all of you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Tiago, for this uh, very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, so on new electrochromic device, more sustainable, as well as with the uh, enhanced properties. So let me check. So we don't have uh, any questions so far. We might have by the end of the session. So, but as for now, I would like maybe to handle uh, one curiosity. Uh, mm -hmm. So you could uh, like uh, develop nanoparticles, so uh, water soluble based on this polymer. Can you have also different uh, forms, different shapes? I mean, can you play with that? with the shape of the particles, for instance. Uh, can yes, you comment uh, on that, please? Yeah, sure. Thank you for your question. Uh, that, that was a, a bit of a problem in the beginning because we can control the size of the nanoparticles and we want uh, spherical nanoparticles because this, the enhancement of performance of the nanoparticles due to uh, more crystalline uh, films, okay? So we want it to be a sphere. And when we go from uh, sizes bigger than 400, they are not spheres anymore, they are blobs. So that's why the maximum of a size that we can do with a lot of precision is uh, 400 nanometers. But our goal here was to make spheres, not, we had an other type of structures, but they were not working as well as nanoparticles. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so maybe I would ask you to, to remain uh, on, online so that yes, you can also uh, see uh, in the end, by the end, if there are further questions. So okay. may. thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank so you. Uh, um, I am very pleased now to uh, introduce the next speaker that is uh, Ruth Ferreira, Ruth Pereira, sorry, uh, from Universidade de Aveiro. And uh, uh, Ruth will be talking about uh, uh, iron selenide logic gate nanoparticles for cellular hyperthermia. So Ruth, whenever you, you want, please. Okay, uh, hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Juan, for this kind presentation. So in the previous talk, we heard about um, nanoparticles with very different colors and 
uh, very exciting properties. And now we will talk about nanoparticles that are magnetic. And in my opinion, uh, they have very interesting uh, magnetic properties. So we know that one of the most important parameters in life in general is temperature control. You need temperature control in electronic devices, in animals, food, molecules, reactions. And so it is very important to know when, uh, when the temperature crosses a defined temperature threshold, which may be a minimum or a maximum. Um, so a device that gives us information about an event in which the temperature crossed some limits is really helpful. In other times, what happens is that the crossing of these temperature limits is used to achieve something else. And this is the case of hyperthermia treatment. In this treatment, one of the most important questions is when to stop. Um, at what radiation dose does the temperature increase locally above a given threshold? So in other words, um, when when did the temperature threshold was crossed. So what we want is to develop a device that can give us indication of this heating event. So we developed iron selenide nanoparticles that act as set, reset, flip, flop logic gates. But what does that really mean? So uh, when you apply a magnetic field, our nanoparticles are set into a high magnetization state and they remain in that high magnetization state even after you drop the magnetic field. So they retain memory of that application of a magnetic field. After the magnetic field is gone and they are in a high magnetization, you can reset them into a low magnetization state by applying a temperature above a defined temperature threshold. It's defined according to the size of the nanoparticles and I will explain a little bit more later. So these nanoparticles are very interesting because they can be inserted in biological systems. And so by developing this device, we could have um, a memory record of a defined heating event such as this one where you start in a high magnetization state you apply temperature you cross the temperature threshold they are set into a low magnetization state and even after cooling down they re they retain memory of this event so you probably already heard about a lot of different types of nanoparticles and the most talked nanoparticles are magnetite so I actually already worked with magnetite and magnetite are cons is considered a soft magnetic material whilst iron selenide nanoparticles, this ones I'm talking about, are considered hard magnetic materials and they display a non-volatile, bistable non-volatile response as I explained before. They can give you an indication of one or zero and retain memory. So when we started to develop these nanoparticles, we noticed that the iron selenide family, it's very rich and very difficult to synthesize in order to obtain this, um, this form right here. So this was the state of the art by the time we started trying synthesizing these nanoparticles. And this is what we achieved. So we were very grateful to be able to achieve these nanoparticles. They are actually nanoplatelets, which means that they are really thin and they can be developed uh, with these regions right here. Uh, of course, that the shape, the size can vary according to the ramp rate and the temperature range. I can tell you that this was about two, three years of exploratory synthesis in order to, to achieve these results. So we, we kind of studied a, a lot of details on the synthesis. What we can see here is that uh, by a magnetic study that when we start above the temperature threshold of our nanoparticles, they are always in a low magnetization state because that threshold was crossed. So when we start to cool down and apply a magnetic field, they are set into a high magnetization state. But if we cool them without the application of a magnetic field, they remain in a low magnetization state. So this is what we wanted. 
Um, and as we developed different uh, sizes of nanoparticles, we noticed that except for this little guy right here, um, the tendency is that uh, the bigger the nanoparticle, the higher the temperature threshold. So I took these ones around 200 to 115 nanometers, which are around 42 degrees Celsius of temperature threshold, and I apply them for hyperthermia assays. Okay, so basically I started, we started doing um, some cycle studies. So we wanted to see if our nanoparticles were able to repeat um, several, several events. So what we did was we set them into a high magnetization state by applying a magnetic field. We dropped the magnetic field, they re remained high. And then we applied a temperature above 42 degrees Celsius and they were reset into a low magnetization state. And so we did this over and over and over and we noticed that, okay, this is a reliable uh, instrument, we can use them again and again, so it's working perfectly. And so we took uh, cell culture plates, we coated them with our nanoparticles, um, and at the bottom our nanoparticles stood on top of the nanoparticles, it was casted a matrix gel, so it allowed cell proliferation on top of the gel. And at the same time, it separated our nanoparticles and our cells, so the nanoparticles wouldn't travel and wouldn't be in contact with the cells. And what we did was to subject these cells to two different uh, hyperthermia treatments. So in the first one, we applied um, a power dose that did not exceed the 42 degrees Celsius. So basically in this graph, you can see that our nanoparticles told us that, okay, uh, I'm in a high state. And after the application of the treatment, I'm still in a high state. I still have magnetic signal. So they basically were telling us, you did not cross our temperature threshold. And when we observed the cells uh, from a live dead assay, we noticed that the majority of cells were alive. So our nanoparticles were telling us the truth because at 42, 45 uh, degrees Celsius, the cells start to die. They start cellular death. Um, and when we applied a power dose that allowed our cells to, to achieve a temperature above 42 degrees Celsius, our nanoparticles told us, okay, now we are in a low magnetization state. We don't have magnetic signal, so you crossed our temperature threshold. And our cells were not happy. They were mostly dead. So we noticed that, okay, this was kind of our preliminary assay uh, study to identify um, that these nanoparticles indeed have the properties that we want and can be used as we want them. Of course, uh, this was a work developed in 2018, 2019, so we published this article late 2019. Then I started my PhD, um, uh, sorry, late 2018, exactly as I was saying first. I started my PhD in 2019, and nowadays I'm focusing on um, using these nanoparticles that we described here in different materials and starting to have a 3D idea of what's going on inside cells, inside tumors. And I'm very excited for it. And, and I hope I will be talking to you in the next years with some news. So I would like to thank the organization for this opportunity. Uh, it's the first time I'm speaking on PyCam. PyCam was my first conference when I was 19 years old and I was starting my career as a volunteer researcher in Guimarães. Uh, I met actually met uh, two of my PhD supervisors there, Dr. Vitor and Professor Roman, which is here in the session. And I'm very thankful for that experience and for, and for everything, basically. Thank you all for your kind attention also. Thanks a lot, Ruth, for this great talk on use of uh, logic eight nanoparticles for cellular hyperthermia. So um, let me, uh, I have a curiosity if I may. Uh, so regarding these particles, you compare well with, uh, for instance, the super paramagnetic uh, nanoparticles, so most commonly known as pions, right? Mm. Um, 
So uh, I know that with these particles, the iron selenide, you can work with concentrations much lower, right? Uh, in comparison with the spions. Can you also elaborate a bit more besides what, of course, you have mentioned here uh, in, the, in the slides? Of course. Um, it's really difficult to compare because their properties are very different. So they can't be used for the same stuff. For example, magnetite can be used for magnetic hyperthermia because you can shift there and they start to rotate and warm. And in these nanoparticles, we can't use them for that. But, um, but yes, concentration is still um, something that we are tweaking because um, I, I, I did already some um, biological studies in cells uh, and I, I found like the perfect concentration to, to work. I already performed some hyperthermia treatments inside the cells. We developed some capsules in collaboration with the thesis um, student that has been helping me. And, and together we developed two years ago the capsules so we could get inside the cells and we already have some idea. But of course, we nowadays I'm trying to develop hydrogels. So I'm mixing different materials, incorporating our nanoparticles and every material has a different concentration because in capsules you can have four nanoparticles per capsule and in hydrogels, it's, it's going to be probably a lot higher because uh, we need sensitivity. We need uh, a minimum amount of particles so we can detect. And it always depends on the equipment that you're using. If it, the, the lim detection limit, it's, uh, it can change, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And regarding the, so I think you answered also one of my questions is that if you can combine both types of particles, so and you can, so you have different properties, eventually you can also combine uh, the different uh, types of particles in the system uh, eventually. But maybe one question is regarding the hydrogels that you talked about. So uh, here you are uh, so using for detection of uh, hyperthermia. So do you think that you can also include in the hydrogel some kind of moieties that, okay, when this, uh, to reverse the system, so uh, regarding this uh, temperature sensitive, uh, using this logic gates nanoparticles? To reverse the system, how? In terms of, uh, I mean, uh, in terms of, so the temperature that you are uh, detecting the cell, so if the cell will remain alive or not, if you can somehow, somehow have some kind of memory so that these, memory, that these particles have, right? These nanoparticles have memory. So yeah. what we have been discussing in the past few months, and that, that can be really interesting, is that both in the capsules or in the hydrogels, you can have moieties, as you were saying, in order to, to bring another dimension of treatment. You can have a, a pharmaceutical inside the... Um, the hydrogel, for example, that can be released when a certain temperature is achieved and our nanoparticles remain with the information of that. So maybe that could be interesting. For now, I'm focusing on simple hydrogels and my nanoparticles inside it and the dispersion of it all. So it's kind of being a challenge. But after that, I, I'm really excited because I really believe in this work and I'm, I really like it. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite interesting. Thank you very much. So if there are no further questions, so let's move on. And uh, um, I am pleased to introduce the, the next speaker that uh, is uh, um, Juliana Mota. So Juliana Mota is, from, uh, uh, is working at the Centro de Química Estrutural, Instituto Superior Técnico at Universidade de Lisboa. Um, and uh, uh, today uh, she will be talking about uh, antibiotic coordination frameworks, a new way for drug delivery on bioabsorbable zinc. So please, uh, Juliana, whenever you are ready. Thank you, Jean. So let me share the PowerPoint. You can see it now, right? Yes, perfect. And um, let yes, me perfect. adjust the... So today I will talk about my, my work at uh, what I have been develop, developing in the last months. So it was already reported 
that we have a, go, a global health problem, bacteria about uh, bacteria resistance. This problem kills more than 0 0.5 million people worldwide each year. And if we don't find a solution for, for this problem, we will kill more than 2.4 million people worldwide by 2050. It means that uh, the bacteria are not killed and we and can continue to grow. So uh, these infections caused by antibiotic resistance are difficult and sometimes impossible to, 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 to treat. In most cases, antibiotic resistance infections require an extended hospital stays, additional follow-up by doctors and costly and toxic alternatives. And many, many, many uh, medical advances are dependent on the ability to fight infections using antibiotics. So, and another question that we have is that uh, life expectancy has an increasing trend until 2050 and with a greater tendency to be above 16 years old in worldwide, combined with the fact that uh, bone defects have a higher incidence at these lower ages, bone uh, replacement have an increasing trend. So the antibiotic resistant is a treat that uh, directly affects the develop of such infections related to the use of the bone implant devices. So clearly it's important to extend the useful lifetime of any drug and equally the success of these implantable devices. So I have a solution for that problem. The first step is restrict antibiotics in a clinical use, producing a new antibiotic coordination framework, SCFs, by mechanochemistry. This new structure is similar to the metal organic frameworks but uh, the organic linker, ligands used is, is the clinical antibiotic that is already clinical in use. And the second step is the coating, is the, the step of coating bioabsorbable metal, metallic implants with SAF by electrophoresis. Now I will explain a little bit about, about the methods. So the first one is the mechanochemistry is a solid state approach to um, chemical synthesis, is a chemical transformation sustained by um, the mechanical force is a solvent-free synthesis or use a, a really, really small amount of solvent has been presented as a good way to produce pharmaceutical and chemical and chemical industries for a cleaner, safer, more efficient transformations and simpler than the conventional routes and it's possible to, um, to synthesize manually using a Agatha motor or mechanically using a ball mill. Uh, the initial reagents are added on the reactors and then after grinding, it's possible to obtain the final product. Here we have a schematic uh, image of the mechanism inside the ball mill. The black dots represent the, the steel grinding balls and the smaller dots represent the starting materials. The collusion force direction and kinetic energy between two or more compounds vary greatly within the ball, char, uh, the ball charge. So I have here a video to explain how ball mills is agitated on that case on our lab to obtain the collusion inside the, the jars. And so you can continue, I'm sorry. And after we synthesize the ACF, it's possible to continue the process using electrophoresis as a coating for, uh, for coating bare of zinc. This is consist on the migra migration of uh, charged particle particles under the influence of an, an electric field. The apparatus is composed by a system with the two electrodes emerge in an electrolyte that supports ACF. 
And under a charge of an electric field, these charged particles will migrate uh, to the cathode or to the anode according to the nature of the net charge of ACF. And now I will present uh, the results that we had through the, about uh, the new structure uh, of uh, new ACF through power powder X-ray diffraction is possible to confirm locally the compound synthesized. On this specific case, the starting materials are, has an arteriotic nalilic acid, a colligan salicylic acid, and in coordination with a metal salt of calcium. By a software of simulation, it's possible to obtain the expected single crystal pattern, and it's possible to see that the simulation and the, the uh, product is exactly the same, have exactly the same structure. And here we have a representation of the coordination of the compounds. We have two centers of calcium coordinated with the three molecules of nalidixic acid. And then here we have the salicylic acid. The morphology of the SAF produced are here, and uh, as you can see, have a lemony structure. Um, analyzing the geometry of, uh, of the structure, you can see, sorry, you can see that we have here, as I have said, uh, two centers of calcium uh, that are coordinated with the, uh, with the different geometries. The first one, has a square antiprismic uh, geometry, and the second one has an octahedral geometry. And oh, I'm sorry. Here we have a crystal packing uh, in a view along the B axis with a 1D framework that have a polyhedral uh, representation of the calcium here in green, and the space field representation of non-coordinated water molecules uh, that uh, connected to the center metal with uh, by other hydrogen bonds. We have already confirmed the stability, the stability of the new compound after the same compound produced and then after six months and maintains the structure. And we have here the, stabil uh, the thermal stability of the SAF, the, they show us to be able, to be stable, sorry, between 13 to 100 degrees. Uh, after 100 de degrees, uh, we can see the evaporation of water. And then after uh, SAF starts to deteriorate. After this synthesis, we proceed with the deposition study by electrophoresis and changing the applied field to the system, it's, it was observed that the position just was guaranteed on, uh, to the cases of the pot uh, positive potential. In that case, is we can maintain the, the original structure of the, the ACF. And here we have uh, morphological and uh, physical chemical characterization of the bare zinc. And here after the, um, the position on the functional zinc is possible to confirm the deposition. We have MOF here and amplified here. And the whole areas corresponded by the fact of the positive potential applied to the bare no zinc. And here, we have uh, a characterization after an immersion of six days. Globally, the morphology bet between zinc, uh, clear, uh, the clear zinc and the clear after uh, the position, we have, uh, they are different and we have recognized the, the presence of calcium, phosphate, chloride, together with uh, zinc and oxygen combined suggests the formation of the compounds like cinzit, uh, hydrocinzit, simincolite, hydriopatite, and scorpionite. 
uh, this is comparing to to the this this um, this work that has been developed too, and uh, just uh, to recognize that uh, we have just scorpionite on this case and not on the bear that does, uh, doesn't have uh, any deposition of the of the ACF. For final conclusions, we guarantee the new uh, the new structure of a new ACF is uh, is uh, obtained. Biomechanical chemistry is is an effort uh, using mechanical chemistry represents as an effective way to produce drugs. Uh, we have been successful coating on zinc with ACF. The electrophoresis show us to be able to deposit ACF on zinc. And this strategy, uh, strategy answers uh, simultaneously to um, antibiotic activity and transient bone healing, future perspectives. So these studies show that um, we want to, to, to create a new structures of ACF to improve uh, the, the properties and the efficiency of the drugs, develop systems to deposit ACF without destroying zinc, and extend this study to other type of implants. Um, for finish, I want to acknowledge for FC, uh, FCT, Lisboa 2020, Portugal 2020, FEDER, SCQE também, assim como um, Eu gostaria de agradecer bastante às minhas orientadoras, Dra. Vânia André e Dra. Marta Alves, and thanks to Catarina Bravo, Dr. Catarina Santos, Prof. Maria Fátima Montemor, and Prof. Maria Teresa Eduardo. And thank you all for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Juliana, for this very nice talk. Um, let me check whether we have questions. Well, I have here one question regarding this. If we, I guess you call it as well biomoth, right? Right. Um, so uh, in most of the case, so this, uh, this is a very interesting approach for, um, for enclosing uh, active pharmaceutical compounds, mainly, right, to increase the, the um, uh, solubility and the, as well as the, the, um, the bioavailability. So um, how it works in terms of, uh, if you want to use the MOFs as the reservoirs of these molecules for, for instance, for drug delivery, I guess you mentioned, uh, you talked also a bit about that. Um, how can you control the, the, the release? I mean, what is the, the way? This also is dependent on the biomolecule that you use as well. Can you comment? It will, be, de it will be dependent uh, about the coordination that we have, about the compounds that we use, the start materials. but. At this moment, I don't have this information and how can degradate. I just guarantee that I'm using uh, uh, a medical products that we already know, like I have said, an LADXIC acid. And I know that we, we have studies and <laughs> they are being used for a long, long, long years ago. So we are, we are, uh, how can I say it? I'm sorry. Um, Going to there? They are safe. They are safe and they are. They have a, a good response. Not now because because of the bacteria resistance, but they, they have they have good re response on our body. We are just in in when we change the structure, we 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 change. We can change how our body responds to, to these new drugs. Thanks a lot. So let me just check whether we have more questions. So I don't think so. So maybe uh, let's see, we'll, we'll come back uh, by the end of this session just to see whether we have more questions, if I may. So thank you very much again, Juliana, for this very, very nice talk. So uh, now I will uh, uh, um, would like to introduce the last speaker of this session, just before the break and the poster session. Uh, so it will be um, delivered by Carlos uh, Shiraishi. So I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce it well. Um, it's coming from Instituto Politécnico de Bragança and uh, uh, with, a with a, a talk entitled uh, In Silico, Evaluation of a Library of Natural Compounds Identified in Mushrooms as Potential Inhibitors of Proteins Associated to Breast Cancer, PPRR, uh, Gamma Aromatase and 17AHSD1. Please, whenever you are ready, Carlos. 
Hello. The... Yes, we can hear you. You can you can see. And now we cannot. Uh... Yeah, you are sharing. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Hello, uh, it's a pleasure to present my research in this Congress. And, and my name is Carlos, my orientator is Dr. Rui Abreu, and co orientator is Odinei Rejas Gonçalves. Mm, my, my research in silico evaluation of a liberating of natural compounds identified in mushrooms as potential inhibition of proteins associated to breast cancer, PPR gamma aromatase, and 70B. ASD1. My my presentation is is I'm in, in Shelly, and according to this article, the worldwide there are nine million new cases of cancer, ten million cancer deaths occurred in 2020. Female breast cancer was the mostly diagnosed cancer with estimated 2.3 million new cases for a year. In Portugal, according Liga Portuguesa contra o Cancro, about six new cases of breast cancer are detected every year. 25% from the die from this disease. Therefore, studies to understand the mechanism are needed. In this scenario, this breast cancer is is Swiss no contain enzymes responsible for the local biosynthesis of stretch alpha circulants precursors, such as 70B HSD1, aromatase, and PPR gamma. The first protein, 17B HSD1, is responsible to synthesize mainly. 17 bad stradiol E2 and estrogenic harmonic that stimulated the growth of breast cancer cells. Observing so in other articles too. And in the next protein, the aromatase or CP19 acetochrome P450 is the enzyme to synthesize estrogens. Aromatase regulates the production of estrogen in breast cancer, observing in these articles. And PPR gamma, peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma, is expressed in many tumors, including breast cancer. But need to understand PP gamma against this potential pharmacologic compounds against breast cancer. To observe in these articles. So, mushrooms in the search for compounds that can perform modulations of these proteins are the compounds present in mushrooms with medicinal activities and untumor potentials. I, you can uh, observe in these articles. And in my group, the study, in 2011, published this article, denominated using molecular docking to investigate the anti-breast anti cancer activity of low molecular weight compounds present in mushroom. Prof. Abreu and Ferreira construed, developed a LMW library, low molecular weight library with com much medicinal compounds from mushrooms and inhib inhibition the proteins aromatase, strony sulfatase, and 70BASD1. So, my, in my research, I amplified this library. The, the new libraries uh, have 190 compounds, the diversity families. It's heavy terpenes, steroids, zooflavones, flavones, catecols, phenols, quinones, hydroquinones, alkaloids, aldeides, amides, 
fatty acids, lactones, and amino acids derivatives. So, in my studies, in silico studies, I identify the best predicted compounds to have interaction to protein involving breast cancer. In my methodology, I'm using the, the identify the molecular molecules with medicinal potential mushrooms available in literature, design and prepare ligands and protein in PDB kit format. I'm preparing the ligands using diversity softwares. First, I'm using ChemSketch to draw compounds and use, so using software Vegas to optimize the molecule and using Autodoc tools for convert in PDB kit format. And how I, and, and I prepare the protein in download from PDB Protein Data Bank and preparation using Autodoc tools software solving in format PDB kit. All the compound and protein is in PDB kit because Autodoc Vina software using this format. I'm using, when do you make a docking? Do you is only, only one for one? Because, but I'm using, I'm using other software to automate the process developed from April 20, 2010. And I'm having a relation pharmacocinetic with my, my, my database. And my material is only my computer Acer Spin. And from the results to doc analysis of a mushroom library, the first protein, 70 beta HSD1, the best compound is 3B5 alpha 22E Ergosta 7, 22, 24, 28, 3N, 3 all. The, this compound is having the best interaction for this protein. And it's having a predict inhibition constant 0 0.151 nanomolar. This compound, according Lee et al., is having an antitumoral activity. And this compound is provenient to mushroom Morchella esculenta. And pharmacocinetic ovulation, this compound is, doesn't have the best oral bioavailability and interactions gastrointestinal or permeability cerebral. And this compound is having only one violation in Lipinski release. And the next, from aromatase protein, the compound eringiacetal A is having a good interaction from inhibition, inhibition estimated, estimated inhibition, 33.3 nanomolar. This, comp this compound in the protein is having interaction with amino acids leucine 477. And this compound, according to Kikuchi 2050, is having cytotoxicity activity and is, is, is provenient from mushroom pleurotus euringis. Eu, eu, eringi. And this compound. It serve a good pharmacocinetic profile. It serve a good oral bioavailability and interaction with, with uh, gastrointestinal absorption, AEA, and only one violation to Lipinski rules. So, in the, the last PPR gamma, the compound ergosta 7. 22 GN 
3B, all, proveniente de mushroom, pleurotus, eurigi, so, e serve a predictive estimate 5.2 nanomolar. This compound is the, in the protein, e serve interaction with amino acids, valine 342. And according to Kikushi 2017, this compound is have antitumoral activity. So, this compound is, it, it, it doesn't have the, the best pharmacokinetic, but it doesn't have bioavailability and interaction for blood brain barrier or gastrointestinal absorption and have only one violation for Lipinski rules. So, the best compounds, all compounds is steroids compounds and identify the, the mushroom provenience. So, but need experimental validation to confirm the results. In my conclusion to my research, among the 109 compounds, compounds from the steroid family stand out. Eringiacetal A as best pharmacokinetic profile and understanding the types ligands against proteins involved in breast cancer process. And check in the lab this for a conclusion. In additional information, institutions supporting breast cancer in Portugal is Liga Portuguesa contra o Cancro, Associação Caminhar Contigo, Associação Portuguesa de Apoio à Mulher com Cancro, da mama. And my, my reference is this, and thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Carlos, for this uh, very nice talk. Okay. So let's just check with the questions if we have. So do you think that uh, this, this characterization that you have made uh, could identify some uh, potential uh, uh, anti-cancer agents. Um, what are the next steps that you that you are envisioning in this work to for using these compounds? Ne ne next next pass is realization the dynamic simulation for available this compound is 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 retained in the protein. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So how long it takes this, this studies for, for each uh, 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 agent? How long it takes? It depends, I know it might depend in terms of the in silico, but how long it, it takes you to, to make a study, a, a full study of the compounds? Can, can you... In, in terms of the time, how long it takes the study uh, while you make the in silico study? Mm. Mm. It is, I mean, you are doing computational modeling, right? Uh, so how long it takes the process of the, the modeling? How long it takes to, to, to give you the results? Yes, I... I... Can, can you formulate it? I, I was just coming, uh, commenting about the time that you take for the modeling while you do the modeling. Uh, yeah. So if, if it is a long, if it is a very time consuming process or not. So if we could just comment, yeah. Yes, it, it's heavy, many softwares. It's, I'm using Vina. Vina is softer, more, more, more fast. But, but it's heavy other software when Autodoc tools, but depends your proteins. It's heavy, uh, proteins do you have more complex and do you have proteins minimum complex? The, my, my database uh, from, from one, uh, 1,090 compounds is processing 
in two, two, two three uh, days, all, 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 all full, full iteration. But, but using other software for Autodoc tools is more, more days, more days. But the, the dynamic simulation is, is needs to require more process. Dynamic simulation, do you can't, do you can't make a, a lot of compounds? Do you make only one? Because large, large process do you need. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, Carlos. So we have uh, uh, one more question. Uh, so from uh, Professor David Fulton. Um, so uh, he's asking, uh, can you tell us a bit more about the modes of binding? So what interactions are driving the, bi the binding? Yes, uh, have uh, interaction covalent and hydrogens. So covalent bonding and hydrogen bonding. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Carlos, and uh, thanks a lot also to the uh, other speakers. So uh, uh, Tiago, Juliana, Ruth, as well as uh, uh, Professor David Sultan for the great lecture. And now, uh, uh, so I guess we are for the we are ready for the break and the uh, post session. But I am pleased to, to hand over to the organizers. If you have to, to, to give yeah. the word. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Again, thank you so much for the oral communications and also the invited, the invited speakers. Thanks also to the chair, to João and Professor João Manu. Thank you all for your uh, participation in the Congress. Uh, yes, we will go now to the poster session. Don't forget to vote uh, in the three best posters and we will see you again at 4.45, okay? In half an hour, more or less. Thank you so much and see you soon. Thank you.
Hello everyone, good afternoon. So let's begin the, the third session of today's work. Uh, I will pass on to Professor uh, Beatriz Oliveira and she can, she will be the chair of this session. So Professor Beatriz. Hello. Hello, professora. Pensei Good que tinha ativado, mas não tinha. No. No, a, a minha parceira também já está ali. Não é? Joana Madureira. Mm -hmm. Yes. Portanto. É para so nós. I will move on to you. Um, see you soon, professor. Ok. Isto é em inglês? Tem que apresentar em inglês yes, ou posso yes. apresentar em português? In English. Em inglês? Em inglês? Yes, okay. yes. Ok. This is a pleasure and I thank the uh, organization of PICAM to invite me to present these sections. And the, the speaker is Álvaro Goianes is here with us, he is from, um, is a, holds a PhD in pharmaceutics, he is co-founder and development director of uh, entrepreneurship, um, the first company focused on developing 3D printing technology for fabrication of personalized medicines and medical, medical devices. Uh, the presentations, the 3D printing of pharmaceutical products, the future is now, is a good title and I very I'm very excited to hear your presentation. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Beatriz Oliveira, for your uh, nice introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, and see if uh, it works. Um, yeah, I hope you can see my screen now. Yes, yes. Yeah, perfect. We can see. Perfect. So um, let me see if I can select the pointer. Yeah, okay. I'm good now. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation to to be um, in this uh, conference, in, in this meeting. It was a, a bit surprising for me because I, I'm not uh, Portuguese, I'm not young, and I'm not a chemist, so I'm not sure why I'm in this uh, conference, but uh, well, I'm, I'm from Galicia, so I'm half Portuguese, I can say. I'm not so old, so maybe it's, it's not a problem. And I'm a pharmacist, so maybe I can uh, show something related to, to chemistry in, in my presentation. So um, as Beatriz uh, Oliveira mentioned, I am going to talk about 3D printing of pharmaceutical products. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I, I work in a company that is uh, called Fabrics. Fabrics uh, fab is from fabrication and RX from uh, prescriptions. So uh, uh, we do fabrication of prescriptions, fabrication of medicines, and it's a spin out company from uh, UCL, University College London. So the company is based in central London. But I'm also uh, linked uh, somehow to Galicia, to Santiago, because I'm a part time uh, lecturer at the University of Santiago de Compostela. So I spend part of my time in in Spain, in Galicia. Uh, when we are talking about 3D printing, uh, sometimes people talk about 3D printing and, and they call 3D printing is the next industrial revolution, the next uh, revolution. So I, I would like to explain a bit about 3D printing and the different technologies, but I would like to put first 3D printing in the context of uh, history. So, um, uh, if you remember from the history class, the first industrial revolution started in the 18th century. And it was just because uh, we started using steam and water as a source of energy. Uh, and we moved from 
hand production to mechanical production, just with the steam and water. Uh, I always like to show this uh, picture here, probably, I don't know if you can see properly, but it's a, a steam locomotive. And, and in front of the steam locomotive, uh, there is a horse, because at the beginning, uh, people thought that the, the, if the train, the steam locomotive was moving very fast, people could die uh, because of the lack of, of oxygen. So that's why there was this uh, horse uh, in front of the locomotive. And, and it gives idea about the, the crazy concepts or the crazy uh, misunderstandings or, or, or wrong ideas that people can have with these new uh, technologies. But well, uh, the, the important thing is that before the Industrial Revolution, all the products were handmade, designed for each person. So everything was uh, custom made. Uh, but after the, the first Industrial Revolution, we moved to the mechanical production uh, and, and we made objects not by hand, but with other tools and, and uh, uh, equipment. Then in the 19th century, we moved to the second industrial revolution. And, and this uh, was based on the division of labor and the ele electrical energy. And we moved from mechanical production to mass production. And here you can see the, the Henry Ford factory where all the cars are in this um, uh, lines for manufacturing cars. Then in the 20th century, we move to the automate production just because of the use of electronics and IT computers. And uh, humans were uh, replaced by robots in these new factories. And now we are in what we call fourth industrial revolution or, or even fifth industrial revolution that is based in cloud technology, uh, internet of things, now all the tools are connected to internet and we are in a stage where we can get what is called mass customization. So we are able to prepare and to manufacture uh, many different types of objects, but in an automatic mode. So it's somehow like we move uh, before the first industrial revolu revolution in terms of uh, customization, but uh, in terms of mass production, we are at the forefront because we can prepare many different objects with many different uh, shapes or colors or, or whatever. And one of these uh, technologies, the main technologies used in this industrial revolution is 3D printing. So what is 3D printing? Uh, probably you know what 3D printing is, but basically in 3D printing, what we have is a, is a 3D model that is inside a computer. Uh, this 3D model can be made by a person, designed by that person, or could be obtained by a sc a scanning a, a person or, or getting a scanner of an object and, and you get this 3D model. This 3D model can be sent to a equipment, to a piece of equipment that is a, a 3D printer, and then you press in, enter intro and then uh, you manufacture or you create the object that is designed. Uh, as you can see, there are many different types of objects that you can prepare using 3D printing for, uh, from castles, very big buildings, concrete buildings, from plastic to cells, uh, metal, very, very small objects like in the range of the micrometers. Uh, and now, uh, nowadays, I don't think there are materials that cannot be 3D printed. Most of the materials, glass, uh, all the metals, cells, plastic, uh, uh, can be 3D printed. So the, the 3D printing technologies is uh, very versatile. So what I'm going to talk today is about the, the use of 3D printing in, for healthcare applications. Uh, for medical applications, uh, we have some examples like uh, that are uh, right now in the market. Uh, for example, 95% of the hearing aids that are in the market and are made by 3D printer, uh, using 3D printer. 3D printers are used now to make um, new tissues or, or small organoids of cells just using 3D printing. And uh, in dentistry, it's very common, I don't know if you heard about the Invisalign, that are a kind of uh, invisible brackets that uh, are made, uh, in part of the process are made by 3D printing. The, the last part of the process is a thermoforming, but uh, to, the, some molds are made using 3D printing. But what I'm going to talk is about uh, 3D printing of medicines. Uh, we call them uh, printlets, it's coming from 3D printed tablets, and, and they can look very similar to the conventional uh, medicines that uh, we can take, but uh, 
they, they, they have some advantages over the, the traditional medicines. So um, what is the advantage of 3D printing? Well, 3D printing, since we have a digital design, we can uh, easily change the object that we want to create just changing the digital design. So it's very easy to personalize the medicine, to personalize the object. And why there is a need for personalization? Well, for medicines, it's very simple because everybody is different in age, gender, uh, ethnicity, different diseases, different body types. Uh, and sometimes uh, people have uh, or have to take different types of medicines and are taking at the same time uh, several medicines. So uh, some medicines affect uh, other medicines. So um, the need for personalization is very easy to see, especially with children. And uh, uh, because when they grow and depending on the weight or depending on the age, sometimes you need to give uh, different doses. The, the standard approach right now for medicines is that you go to the pharmacy and in the pharmacy there are like two, three or, or four different doses and, and you select the dose that is uh, better for you. Uh, that is the, the approach that is called one size fits all. So uh, you have uh, specific sizes that you give to all the population. But what we propose is the opposite approach, approach that is to make the medicine especially designed for the patient. So for each patient, uh, each patient has different individual characteristics. We give a personalized medicine, a 3D printed medicines. And why 3D printing? Well, because with 3D printing, we can, as I said, change the dose. If we increase the, the size of the 3D model, uh, we increase the dose. So we can change the dose very easily. Also, it's possible to change the shape. If we are thinking, thinking about oral dosage forms, we can change the shape. And, and we found that changing the shape uh, we can uh, increase the adherence to the treatment because some people prefer this type of shapes and other people prefer more the cylinder type of shapes. So we can make the, the medicines more attractive for, for people. We can, for example, create a, in the same medicine, incorporate different drugs. Here you see in one side the 3D model of uh, four different drugs and here, this is the printlet printed with four different, in this case, food, food colorants to be able to see these food colorants. And we can create medicines with different designs, very specific designs with one drug in the outer layer and another in the inner layer. So we can have release of this drug in different regions in the GI tract. So there are many different options. And this is only talking about oral formulations, but we can make medical devices that are drug loaded as well. Uh, this is uh, basically our business model. We are going to put uh, in the market uh, medicines where everybody's very nationalistic. So we are going to put in the, in the market model uh, medicines with the flag of each country. Uh, as you see, we have the Spanish one, uh, we didn't do the Portuguese one, but uh, it would be very easy, <laughs> trust me. Uh, we are still working with these uh, other countries that are more complex. We, we managed to get the, um, the UK flag, for example, but this uh, would uh, require more resolution, so we're still working on that. Um, the applications of 3D printing would be uh, for clinical or preclinical studies. For, for clinical and preclinical studies, uh, normally, we select a, a reduced number of people and we are giving different doses uh, to these patients. And for preclinical study, this means with animals, we need to prepare very small doses. Uh, and for example, you see a, a very small uh, capsule type uh, medicine for, for uh, administration in, in rats. Uh, and we use, for example, for uh, rapid administration in, in hospitals. So if there is a real need for, for a quick medicine, you can prepare a medicine very quick in a hospital. Or maybe in the future, we can have printers in the, uh, in the space, in the starships. Whenever we go to Mars, we, we can have uh, printers there to prepare our, our own medicine. And so many potential uh, opportunities. Um, what we are working and in, in our company and in the university is uh, working in what we call the virtuous cycle of personalized medicine. That uh, in, in the future, uh, a patient will go 
to the doctor because there is a therapeutic need, either because we have a, a, a wearable device that says that something is wrong, or we have a analytic test or, or a genetic information that says that something is wrong and there is a therapeutic need. So we need to go to the doctor. The doctor prepares a digital prescription. This digital prescription is sent to the pharmacy. In the pharmacy, it's transformed in a 3D digital design that is sent to the printer. And in the print, uh, in the pharmacy of the, of the same hospital or in a community pharmacy, the medicine is printed and is given to the patient. If, if the treatment is correct, uh, maybe the treatment can stop, or if it's necessary to change the treatment or adjust the dose, this cycle goes and continues. Uh, the number of times is, is necessary uh, to keep the, the, the therapeutic need under control. So uh, obviously in this whole process, uh, there, is, uh, there are some needs like verification of dose because we need to print uh, the medicines uh, but we need to be sure that we are printing the right dose and, and the right medicine. And for that, we are using near infrared technologies to characterize the medicines that we are printing or, or Raman technologies or, or other spectroscopic methods that are not destructive. So there is a lot of room for improvement in this area. Uh, but also th there is the need of uh, software to, to prepare this um, uh, prescriptions and translate these prescriptions in, in 3D models. We need new printers. We need to develop new formulations. Uh, we need the artificial intelligence to control this whole system and diagnostic tools like uh, electrochemical sensors to, to do therapeutic drug monitoring. Uh, I, I saw that there are some posters about uh, electrochemical sensors. So this is something that is going to be needed in this model that we propose. Obviously, this model is not going to be uh, suitable for all the medicines. For example, paracetamol maybe is not necessary because it doesn't change that much the effect if we take uh, 500 milligrams of paracetamol or one gram, so it's fine. But for, for the new drugs that are coming, the biological drugs or, or drugs that have like uh, uh, a short uh, therapeutic uh, window, um, we need this type of system to control the dose uh, and regarding 3D printing, well, 3D printing, I spoke about 3D printing, but there are many 3D printing technologies. Uh, you cannot see here because uh, I always select this slide on purpose because you cannot see what is written and you have to trust me. So that's fine, don't worry. But according to the American Association for Testing Materials, uh, there are like seven main categories of 3D printer. Uh, but then uh, there are different su subcategories and sometimes there are combination of different categories. Uh, this is a field that is evolving very, very fast and every year new technologies are, are appearing. So the, the main seven categories are these material extrusion, powder bed fusion, material jetting, binder jetting, direct deposition, but photopolymerization and sheet laminations. And some of them can be used for 3D printing medicines. Others. Uh, other ones cannot because they, they are either very energetic and there is degradation of the drug or it's, it's not possible. So I'm going to talk and mention quickly some of them to, to show you how it's possible to print with drugs. Uh, drugs are molecules and you need to be careful to not degrade or destroy or avoid the chemical reactions that can ruin the, the medicine. So this is a critical process. The, the, best, the, the first one is a binder jetting uh, and also called uh, one, one of the sub, subtypes of binder jetting is powder bed inject head printing. So how this is work? So in this one, we have a reservoir with powder and this powder is a mixture of, uh, in, in case of printing medicines, a mixture of excipients, pharmaceutical excipients and drugs. That uh, and we have a roller that is creating layers of powder here in this uh, chamber. So we have a, a flat area that is a powder, and then we have this uh, nozzle that is spraying small um, drops of liquid on top of this powder. So whenever we put these drops of liquids on top of the powder, there is going to be agglomeration of the particles. But if we don't put drops, there is just the loose powder. So 
uh, in each layer, this moves down and this moves up and we are creating more layers of powder, more layers of material, and we are agglomerating these uh, layers of material in the points where it's interesting to agglomerate the material. So uh, inject printing is also called additive manufacturing because what we are doing is adding uh, new layers of materials and uh, agglomerate these materials using different technologies. In this case, it's just wet granulation or agglomeration due to the uh, liquid that we are spraying. And this technology is very interesting because uh, it's technology that is used for one pharmaceutical company in US, it's called Aprecia Pharmaceuticals, to prepare the first and until now the only one 3D printed medicine that is in the market in US. And, and it's a, a medicine that was designed uh, to dissolve in the mouth very quick. So if you take this and you put it in the mouth in three seconds, it's going to dissolve completely. And uh, it's designed to facilitate or to, to make easier the swallowing these this, uh, medicines because uh, sometimes you can have like high drug loading for, for these medicines. Uh, but well, this technology is not used for personalized. In this case, it's used for industrial scale manufacturing and they prepare just this for those, for some specific medic, uh, medicine, uh, Spritan, that, that the drug is leb Levetiracetam, uh, but it's not personalized. And I'm, more, I'm talking more about personalized medicine and this is an example of 3D printing, but not personalized. Another technology, alternative one, is selective laser sintering. Uh, it's a type of uh, powder bed fusion. And this is very similar to the previous one. We have the roller here. This uh, looks like liquid, but it's powder. So we are creating layers of powder. And here we have a laser. And this laser is the what is going to agglomerate the particles. So in, in the previous one, there was a granulation process. In this one, what we have is a, a sintering process, a, a kind of a superficial melting of the particles. And we can create a tablets with this aspect. And uh, these tablets can release the drug that is inside, depending on the composition of the excipients that we are using. Uh, when we have drugs and want, we want to see how this, uh, sorry, when we have uh, drug products, medicines, and we want to see how they are going to behave in vivo, what we do is uh, do a in vitro dissolution test. So to, to predict how it's going to behave in vivo. So we put these tablets and, and we put them in a kind of uh, dissolution vessel that, with a paddle that is steering, and we measure the concentration of drug in the liquid. So the concentration of drug is growing slowly as soon as the drug is uh, going to be released from the medicine. And sometimes we change the pH of the dissolution media. For, for example, here we can change pH for two hours at pH 1.2 or 1.5 to simulate conditions of the stomach. Then we can move the pH and the composition for to different values to simulate conditions of the small intestine or conditions of the column. So we can simulate the in vitro, the conditions that the tablet would face in the GI tract, in the gastrointestinal tract. So here you can see that it's possible to get tablets that release the drug in the stomach and other tablets that release the drug on the column, depending on the composition of the, of the tablets that we select. It's also possible to get tablets that disintegrate very quick in two seconds in a very similar way that the Aprecia Pharmaceutical prepare. So they disintegrate very quick, even though if this technology is based on melting materials. So even these materials are melted, it's a superficial melting or a sintering process. So it, it works fine. Another technology is uh, called fuse deposition modeling. It's a type of uh, material extrusion for sure, if you know any 3D printing technology and you have seen a 3D printer working, uh, I'm 100% sure that probably is this type of printer. And this type of printer uh, uses a, a kind of filament uh, that is similar to a kind of a wire that goes into the nozzle of the printer and then is extruded uh, and melted. So it's pushed it and melted and then uh, the nozzle is moving to create the final object. So what we need to do is um, 
to prepare a, a filament with the drag inside. So we put a drag inside the filament. How we prepare a filament with drag? Well, for that, we use a technology that is called hot metal extrusion. Hot metal extrusion basically is a, a screw that is pushing the material in one direction. So we put here in this uh, feeder or hopper excipients and drag, and this is moving in this way. And here we have a heater and a small hole, an orifice, and then we get uh, the filament. It's not so easy to get a good filament because sometimes we get something that is like a, a spaghetti uh, that breaks very easy or like a, a cooked spaghetti that it, it's, it's too flexible. So sometimes it's difficult to get the, the right one. But uh, if you select the right composition, it's possible to get drag loaded filament that then you can use for printing. Uh, well, actually, we, we develop a artificial intelligence software that is called Medicine. It's online, actually, if you want to check it, that depending on the composition, uh, it, it predicts if it's going to be extrudable or printable or not, and the extrusion and printing temperature. Well, this is the software. So you can select the composition that you want to use. For example, colidon is a pharmaceutical excipient, 35% and other excipients and drag. And then it tells you if it's going to be a good filament, the extrusion temperature, the printability, and uh, it's a prediction method using uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So here you can see some of the examples that, that we use, and it's also possible to control the release of these formulations to get immediate release, sustained release, you can have a formulation that is releasing the drug for 10 hours. So you take it now and it's sustained release for 10 hours or a formulation that doesn't release the drug in the stomach, less than 10%, but then start releasing in the small intestine and colon. So if you want to have a local effect in the colon, we can prepare many different shapes. For example, uh, this uh, we prepared this like at the beginning in five, five years ago or six years ago with paracetamol. So these are medicines with paracetamol. If you have a, a headache, you, you can take this pyramid and then uh, you will have a headache and sore throat. So it's going to cure everything. Um, this is another technology that we developed. That is, uh, instead of having a filament to print, uh, we decide, well, what if we mix hot metal extruder and FDM all together? We called it di direct powder extrusion. And basically what we did is to combine a hot metal extruder here. So you put a powder and the powder is pushed and you extrude directly the powder. So you skip the, the hot metal extruder process. So it's not necessary to get a filament, you just, uh, print directly with the powder, so you save uh, time. Another alternative is uh, called semi-solid extrusion. In, in this one, it's more for pastes. Uh, what we have is like a syringe that uh, contains a kind of uh, gel or a paste that we uh, press the syringe and then extrude this material. We use it for for example, for gummies, we did a study in, in Santiago uh, and we printed the uh, gummies for, these are gummies with different flavors and different colors and different doses uh, for a rare metabolic disease. So we incorporated the uh, different drugs inside uh, and we did a clinical study with patients that have rare metabolic diseases that are normally children. And we made these uh, medicines more acceptable for them and also with the right dose. You know, we also prepare suppositories as well. The, this type of technology using kind of syringes is the technology that is used most of the time for bioprinting when you want to print with cells. Obviously, uh, we don't print with cells. We are more focused on, on drugs, everything with drugs. And, and probably this is the technology that could be more interesting for you that is called uh, the, the big the, the main technology is called bat photopolymerization, but then there are different sub-technologies like stereolithography or uh, DLP, uh, digital light process processing. There are different types. Uh, and these technologies are based on uh, photopolymerization. So here we have a tank with a resin and the resin is a, a liquid. And just with the, with the use of light that could be a laser or just normal light, uh, 
we have photopolymerization. It goes from solid, sorry, from, from liquid to solid. I really like this technology because it is quite fast and the resolution can be very, very good. For, for example, here you see this lattice structure that is very small and, and this is the head of, of a match. So the, the resolution can be very good. And if you want to print with drags, the only thing that you need to do is just mix drags with the resin and you will have the object uh, incorporating the drags. So th this is one of the models of the printers. I think I have a video here. Yeah, I, I have a video. So this is one of the models that we start using. Uh, here we have the, the tank where we put the resins. This is a mixture of drag and monomers. And this is the build plate that uh, this build plate moves down. So this part on top is the build plate. And this part here is uh, the tank or, or the bat where is the resin. So you see the light here. Uh, this is the, the laser. Whatever the laser touches the, the, the resin, the resin goes from liquid to solid. And well, probably, well, this is moving up slowly. And at the end of the process, this moves completely up. Now it's finishing, yeah. And then this is the build plate where we are going to collect the, the medicines. So here you see, these are the, the printlets that, that we prepare that are based on the photopolymerization of the monomer. Uh, which materials we use here? So we use mainly uh, acrylate polymers that uh, mo monomers, sorry, that then photopolymerize. So uh, monomers and oligomers that uh, photopolymerize. Uh, and then we need a photo initiator that is able to, to catch the energy from the light source and, and create like free radicals to react with the monomers. Sometimes we add colorants, we add other fillers, and we add also drags. Um, as I said, the, the resolution of this printer is very good and you print, you can print something very small. Uh, you can print, for example, micro needles. Uh, in our studies, as I said, we are also always use drags. In one of these studies, we use, for example, a, as a cross-linker or, or as a monomer, polyethylene glycol diacrylate, PEG-DA, and as a filler, polyethylene glycol. So this filler is something that is going to be in the middle and it's not going to react. But if you are more filler and less PEG-DA, uh, you are going to get a more release or faster release that if you are more PEG-DA because the PEG-DA is going to create a, a more uh, close structure. So we, we tested with different drugs, paracetamol for uh, amino salicylic acid. And the good point is that compared to other technologies that use heat, uh, here there is no heat involved. Even if the process could be exothermic process, uh, there is no heat involved and there is no degradation of, of potential uh, drugs that are su uh, not suitable for a heating process. It's also possible to use uh, water as a filler and, and prepare hydrogels. So these are some hydrogels that we prepare in incorporating drugs as well. Uh, we did uh, many studies uh, because this technology is very suitable for medical devices. And, and we prepare, uh, for example, these are heading aids that incorporate two different drugs, cipro ciprofluxacin, that is a antibiotic, and fluorcilolone acetonid, that is a corticoid. So it's when you have infection in the median ear or external ear, you can have these uh, heading aids that are releasing the antibiotics. And, and we prepare them with different drug loadings. And well, there is a small change in, in the color, but they are perfect. They can be also flexible depending on the materials that you use. These are the, the CT scan of these um, objects. So to see how it's inside and you see these blue points there that are related to the amount of drug that uh, the, the formulations contain. So this is the 3D model and this is what we printed and, and you see that is very, very similar. Uh, we did a study, uh, for example, using, um, in this case, uh, a scanner, uh, optical scanner. It's very easy to scan yourself with this type of scanner, very cheap. And then you get a 3D model. This was a colleague from the lab. And then from this 3D model, you can cut 
specific part of the model, get a 3D model, for, for example, the nose and print a device. In this case, we printed an anti-acne device that you can put as a mask on top of your nose and it's going to release uh, drugs. In this case, uh, we propose the use of uh, uh, salicylic acid and as an anti-acne device, but this could be used for other type of drugs, for example, for to avoid infections after burns, uh, and could be very simple to use this. Now, even with the iPhone, it's possible to scan uh, using a, a normal phone and to get 3D models. So it's, it's very simple to, to do that. Uh, we did also some uh, studies with flexible materials. Uh, this is a, a design uh, to be inserted in, in the bladder. So this is a bladder device that can be inserted with a catheter in the bladder because uh, the problem of the bladder is that it's very difficult to put medicines in the bladder because the urine is uh, removing whatever medicine or liquid that you place there. So you need a device that is able to release drug in a sustained manner. And, and we prepare devices loaded with different amount of drug that are able to release drug for 15 days or, or even longer if necessary, and they are flexible. So the, for me, this technology is, is very versatile, uh, but um, there are some problems as well. And, and this is a funny study that we did uh, when we were very excited about printing polypills, so different layers of materials. We did a study where we wanted to print oral polypill uh, incorporating these four drugs, atenolol, hydrochloride acid, uh, irbesartan, and amlodipine. Uh, and we printed all of them uh, and they, they look fine. One, two, three, and four with different doses of them. But then when we did the, the drug release, uh, we, we saw this. Uh, so this is one of the drugs, atenolol. So in 10 hours, all release, uh, hydrochloride acid, Tiazide not all released because the solubility is not so, so good. Irbesartan as well. But then for the amlodipine, this is the amlodipine, amlodipine no release. And I thought like, oh, what's going on? Why the amlodipine is not releasing from there? And we crashed the tablets, uh, we, we check, we try to extract all, and there was no amlodipine there. So we thought that there was degradation with this. And this was new for us because we tested with many different drugs and we, we had no problems. But then we found this drug that was either degraded or we didn't know where the drug was going. Um, so at the end, what we discover is we at some point we added a lot of amlodipine just to know if we could find like degradation products or if we could find where the amlodipine was going. Uh, at some point, we thought maybe it's just, uh, we've discovered teletransportation and was moving somewhere else because we couldn't find it, but it was much simpler. So, so this is the amlodipine and uh, there is a group here that apparently reacts very easily with the PEG-DA. This is the PEG-DA. And what we got is that we created this, uh, this big, mixture of drug and, and polymer. Uh, yeah, that for us was unexpected because we thought that there would, wouldn't be any type of reaction between the drug and the monomers. But well, we were a bit naive and, and the drugs, depending on the drugs, are chemical products and they can react. So apparently there was a Michael's addition there. And, and well, uh, at the beginning, uh, <laughs> we were completely lost thinking about where the drug was going. But this actually could be a possibility to create like what is called pro-drugs that are, uh, so the drug is there, but just is not releasing because it's uh, attached with the polymer that is creating the PEG-DA. But this can break and maybe after days or months, the drugs can be released. So this could be a system uh, to release drug in a different manner as well. And there are uh, there are some studies starting about creating this structure, pro-drugs that then are going to release the real drug that is going to make the effect. So th this was a very interesting article for us uh, and, and probably my closest uh, a relation with the chemistry that I had, because most of the process I'm talking about are not so chemistry, are more uh, physical process, uh, melting uh, and other process like granulation. 
but this is a proper reaction. Um, so I explain all these. 3D printing technologies, there are more and it's more complex, but uh, I just to give you a glance about what we do. So we are very focused on getting 3D printers that are specially designed for pharmaceutical uh, uses or pharmaceutical approaches, because right now uh, we had to use printers that were not pharmaceutical. So we are developing a pharmaceutical 3D printer. And actually we, we started in the market to put a printer in the market the last year. Uh, we call it the MediMaker because it's used to make medicines. And uh, we are doing some clinical studies with this. And what uh, we are working is in the hardware that is the printer, the software, that is to control the, the, the software, to control the printer, and also the formulation. So the, the composition of these medicines to make them printable is a key as well. And also depends a lot on the type of uh, 3D printing technologies uh, that you are using. In the future, I imagine that this, these three cornerstones together uh, are going to be used to make uh, medicines for or the process of printing medicines more accessible uh, and easy to, to reach in hospitals. Uh, I imagine a future where we are going to be able to have like a kind of Nespresso capsule that you put into a 3D printer and instead of getting a coffee, it's giving you uh, your medicine, your medicine with the right dose. Or you can select different uh, coffees or sorry, different capsules or, or pods and put them together and you print different drugs in the same um, tablet or in the same uh, printlet all together. So this is what I, I would like to see in the future. And we are working in this direction, not with Nespresso, but working in, in that way uh, to get the, the whole system controlled. And, and as I said, to do that, we need a lot of expertise in formulation development because expecting unexpected re reactions can happen everywhere. And um, I think that that's all from, from me, from my side. We have collaborations with many companies and, and many uh, universities. Uh, since I'm in the University of Santiago de Compostela, my colleagues have collaboration and, and we had collaborations with uh, teams in University of Porto and Lisbon uh, and well, all universities all around the world and, and companies. And uh, I always finish my presentations uh, talking about 3D printing uh, because, well, now this is moving forward and it seems that it's moving, but three or four years ago, when I was talking about 3D printing of medicines, everybody was like, uh, this goes nowhere. Uh, and maybe three years ago was true because we were not able to print many drugs, that there was degradation of some drugs, but now this is, is moving. And since that time, three years ago, I used to say, okay, don't think about what we are able to do now. Think about what we are going to be able to do in the future. And, and now I, I am very happy because I can say, okay, look what we are doing now, but think as well of about what we can do in the future. So don't think about these early manif manifestations or, or, or this early data and think about what we can do about printing medicines in the future. And since you are a um, chemist and young and you have all your future in front of you, uh, I invite you to think about potential opportunities using 3D printing uh, and all this chemistry involved in 3D printing of pharmaceuticals and you can find more information and uh, we are happy to, to discuss and collaborate with, with everybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And now we have one question, I think, in the question from Bruno Melgar. Thank you, Alvaro, for the interesting talk. Would you be able to identify which are the main drawbacks to, of this transition to printlets? related to the synergistic or antagonistic effects from drugs or excipients with the new releasing materials 
so students could also focus some of their research objectives. Do you understand my English? Yeah, your English, yeah. Uh, the question is... Yeah, the question is a bit tricky. Uh, uh, but, uh, well, I, I would say that, as I mentioned, there are many 3D printing technologies, and each technology has some disadvantages and advantages, and it's very difficult to, to say, well, this is the key point. Uh, so I, I would say... Uh, it's necessary to do like proper research using all the technologies because I'm not really sure 100% which one is going to be the technology that is going to be always in the hospital. We are working with many different technologies. And um, th the main point always is to find uh, materials that provide good stability for the drug. So the drug is stable. And regarding the release, sometimes you want fast release, sustained release. It depends on your needs uh, and the needs of, and of the patients. So it's not easy answer here. It's not easy. <laughs> and I have one question. I'm like you, pharmacist. So, but I work in food chemistry. Mm -hmm. I like it. I work in food. And what about the 3D printing with food? Yeah, it's a it's an area that is is uh, evolving very fast. Uh, people printing. Uh, many different materials uh, from candy. We were working in the past with a company that were uh, manufacturing candy and, and were able to, to write messages uh, like uh, letters, uh, like Merry Christmas or whatever with candy and then you can eat. Uh, also, the, it's, it's something quite new, the use of uh, uh, like food, like meat substitutive of meat but using 3D printing yes. so that or, or cells that are not coming from animals that are grown in the lab and they are 3D printed. So it's a growing area. And also the, there is a, the advantage of you can have just the food, but add supplements to the food as well. So you can modify the diet. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's, it's a important thing. But as I said, we, we work with drugs, so we want to put always drug on, <laughs> drugs on the, the things. But it's possible to work with materials that are food materials and then add drugs there. Yes, yes, and it's possible also to, to produce uh, dietary dietary uh, supplements with vitamins with minerals mm -hmm. in uh, gummies with yeah. different layers with different colors like you explain about drugs but mm -hmm. with dietary supplements so the future is everything we can do everything with these this yeah. uh, technology and uh, I like it the your presentation I have a lot of ideas to work with my foods foods uh, food my 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 materials my raw materials okay thank you and uh, the the program continues with Joana Madureira I think yes Thank you, Professor Beatriz. Um, I'm pleased to announce the last oral section of this afternoon. Uh, I want to remind that uh, the speakers have 12 minutes to present, and then we have uh, three minutes to, uh, to, to some questions. Hope that uh, we have questions from the, the audience. Uh, the first uh, speaker is um, Ana Filipa Rufino from Universidade de Aveiro, uh, with the work Extraction and Purification of Albumin from Bovin Serum with Ionic Liquid Based Aqueous Biphasic Systems. You can go. Thank you. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, 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 perfect. So, sorry. 
Good afternoon, my name is Ana Rufino and I'm currently a PhD student at CSEC University of Aveiro, where I developed work entitled Extraction and Purification of Albumin from Bovine Serum with Ionic Liquid Based Aqueous Biphasic Systems. So, proteins are biomolecules composed by amino acids and have applications in several areas, being used from the pharmaceutical industry to the food industry as some of these examples. One of the most used families as a model protein is the albumin, which includes bovine serum albumin. Film serum albumin is a global protein, presents high abundance in the serum and has similarity with proteins such as human serum albumin and equine serum albumin and presents a low cost associated. In general, to obtain high purity proteins, currently the most used techniques are precipitation, filtration and chromatography. However, these techniques have several consecutive steps which can decrease the yield. Furthermore, the existence of high sensitivity of proteins to factors such as temperature and pH can compromise the protein structure and activity leading to its denaturation. Therefore, it is currently becoming more relevant finding biocompatible techniques that allow obtaining high degrees of purity without losing yield and preventing protein denaturation. Thus, the use of aqueous biphasic systems emerges as an alternative. Aqueous biphasic systems are a water-based liquid-liquid extraction technique and biocompatible due to its majority content in water and with a low cost associated comparing with the traditional techniques used currently in the industry. Furthermore, the components can be chosen according to the application of the system, where ABS can be formed by combinations of polymers and salts, whereby ionic liquids fit. Ionic liquids are organic salts with low melting temperatures and high thermal and chemical stability. However, the most important property in their application as ABS phase forming components is their character of designer solvents, allowing to tailor the ABS operation performance by changing their chemical structures. Therefore, the goal of this work was the development of ABS based on ionic liquids for the purification of bovine serum albumin from bovine serum. Several conjugations of anions and cations were used for the synthesis of ionic liquids with biocompatible properties, and the pH 7 buffer was used to guarantee the neutral pH of the ABS in order to ensure the maintenance of the bovine serum albumin structure. Initially, eight ionic liquids were synthesized with a conjugation of imidazolium cations, ammonium and sulfonium derivatives, and with anions one classified as good buffer, arginine, and the state. The synthesis starts with addition of the acid to the base, then the washing step was performed, and fi finally the ionic liquid was drying under vacuum. The confirmation of the structure of ionic liquid was performed by NMR. For the determination of the phase diagrams, the cloud point method was used, in which to an aqueous solution of ionic liquid are added drops of phosphator buffer at pH 7, until the initial solution becomes cloudy, and then drops of water are added to the solution to clear, to obtain the percentage of components in which the system is monophasic or biphasic. Here is presented an example of a phase diagram for a system composed by ionic liquid and phosphate buffer being shown the binodal that separates the two zones biphasic and monophasic below of this. The first studies were done on the migration of pure bovine serum albumin in the system, evaluating the extraction efficiency and the yield by size exclusion HPLC. This allows to select the ionic liquid based ABS with the best performance for the second part of the work. So, with the real sample, bovine serum, different serum dilutions were evaluated. The date of yield and purity were used to select the best dilution. After that, and with these parameters selected, an ultrafiltration step was performed to remove ionic liquid, and the proteins were retained above the filter and were solubilized in phosphate buffer saline for the evaluation of protein structure by STH page and circular decrease. So, starting with the determination of the phase diagrams, we can verify that with the increase of the hydrophobicity of ionic liquid, there was the increase of the ease of the formation of two phases, being the salt the salting out of the uh, agent of the system. For bovine serum albumin migration studies, it was verified that for two of the systems under study, the formation of ABS with the protein was not possible, with the total precipitation of the system, both containing the arginate as an ion of the ionic liquid. 
For the remaining systems, the prepared mixing point was 35% of ionic liquid, 20% of sulfate buffer. There was a total migration of the protein to the top phase, corresponding to ionic liquid phase. Thus, extraction efficiencies of 100% were obtained for all systems. However, the yield obtained varied in the range between 44 and 85%. Thus, the system with ionic liquid tetrabutyl ammonium state was chosen to proceed with the studies applying bovine serum. With ionic liquid chosen for the formation of ABS, different dilutions of bovine serum were studied with the same mixture point. Of the four serum dilutions studied, the one that allowed the best performance was the 1 to 15 dilution, with a yield of 52%, purity of 89%, and a corresponding purification factor of 2.4. After the ultrafiltration was performed, the ionic liquid was thus removed and proteins were solubilized in phosphate buffer saline to be possible to analyze the maintenance of the structure. By STS page, we can verify the purity and the protein profile of the serum. By circular decoism, it is also possible to verify that the structure of bovine serum albumin was maintained. Concluding, it was possible to develop ABS composite by ionic liquids and phosphate buffer at pH 7. The extraction efficiencies of pure bovine serum albumin were 100% in one single step, with the migration of bovine serum albumin occurring for the top phase, uh, corresponding to ionic liquid phase. With the use of bovine serum, it was possible to achieve a maximum of 52% of yield and 89% of purity for the ABS with ionic liquid tetrabutyl ammonium state. The maintenance of the structure was comproved by STS page and circular decreasing. And Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anna. Uh, congratulations uh, for the work. Uh, I don't know if uh, we have any question. I think no. I just have um, a curiosity because it's yes. not my research area. And um, what is the, the, the next step for your work after this? Uh, these results? This work is um, almost uh, complete. I don't have to do um, many more uh, laboratory, laboratory work, but uh, um, I, I, this work is barely complete. Finish? Yes. yes. And, uh, but it's possible to, to to use to try another uh, ionic liquids to to yes I I tried uh, all of ionic yes. liquids that I showed here sorry yes and you have yes. a good uh, and uh, uh, the best performance was obtained with the ionic liquid that I yes 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 here yeah but um, we try all and uh, I have. Um, uh, less purity and less yield. So this is the best this choice is, is for, uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, the next uh, speaker is uh, Marci Martins from uh, CIMAR and the University of uh, Porto. Uh, and uh, she will present uh, the work entitled Towards the Discovery of Small Molecules with Potential Neuroprotective Properties. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes, okay. it's perfect, yes. So to start with, I would like to greet everyone. As it was said previ previously, my name is Marcia Martins. I'm a master's student from the Master of Pharmaceutical Chemistry at the Faculdade de Farmacia da Universidade do Porto. And uh, for my dissertation, we are develop uh, developing a work about the discovery of small molecules with potential neuroprotective properties. Alzheimer's disease affects a major part of our population being extremely important to find an efficacious treatment. The presence of amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary layer rectangles are considered two major hallmarks. Regarding amyloid plaques, they are mainly formed by beta amyloid peptide, 
form the amyloid metabolization of APP, where the enzyme beta secretase or base 1 is mainly involved. In the case of neurofibrillary tangles, they are mainly formed by hyperphosphorylated tau protein, where the enzyme GSK3 beta has a key role. Uh, the development of a multi-target direct ligand capable of inhibiting base 1 and GSK3 beta is, is a thinkable strategy to find an efficacious treatment to fight the, to, to stop progression of this disease. Here one, it is known that the presence of duanidine motif and cyclic amide group is important for establishment of interactions with base 1 and GSK3 beta. Irwine, their incorporation in a tricyclic scaffold, a privileged structure for drugs uh, with action in central nervous system, would be benefic. Regarding all this information, we have the synthesis of multi-target direct ligands capable of inhibiting base 1 and GSK3 beta and evaluating due to their neuroprotection properties and effect on the enzyme's activity. Starting with synthesis, Firstly, docking studies were perfor uh, performed and only the most promising compounds were synthesized. A starting material, we have a tricyclic scaffold, R with a carboxylic acid in its structure, which in the presence of a base, a coupling reagent, COMO and an amine, will lead to the formation of an amide, which later can be reduced to the respective amine in the, pres the presence of a reductor agent, BH3-THF. With this method, 10 compounds were successfully synthesized and purified. According to the obtained product, the, the workup will differ. In the case of the mine, an extraction with ethyl acetate will be done and the organic phase will be, will be washed with an acid and basic aqueous solution followed by brine. To ensure the compound's purity, a preparative chromatography in Colium was done. Following all these steps, Eight amides and two amines were successfully synthesized. To ensure that the obtained compounds were the desired ones, we performed some structure. Uh, we performed their structure elucidation, and here we have the spectra, the uh, proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectra of compound number nine, and uh, at higher chemical shifts are the signals attributed to the protons of the tricyclic scaffold and at lower chemical shifts are uh, signals attributed to the protons of um, the inserted amine. The structure of this compound was later confirmed by X-ray crystallography. After the synthesis of these compounds, we wanted to evaluate their neuroprotection, neuro, their neuroprotection properties against FENTA and MPP plus induced cytotoxicity using differentiated SHSY5Y cells. However, firstly, it was necessary to determine the non-cytotoxic concentrations, and for that, three assays were used. Here, we have present the results of neutral red uptake assay, which proved which uh, was the assay which was the most sensitive assay for our compounds. As we can see, concentrations of 10 and 25 micromolar were non-cytotoxic to the cells. However, we see a slight reduction for concentrations of 25 micromolar in compounds 4 and 7, but the cell vi vi viability was still higher than 85%, which is not considered dead. The concentrations of 10 and 25 micromolar were used in subsequent assays, and we evaluated their neuroprotection properties. Against iron-induced cytotoxicity, several compounds demonstrated potential. However, the compounds 2, 7, and 8 were the most promising ones against this chemical aggressor. We also evaluated neuroprotection properties against MPP+, and in this case, only the compounds 3 and 4 demonstrated some potential against MPP+. It is also important to evaluate the effect of the compounds on P glycoprotein or PGP once this efflux transporter is directly um, involved in beta amyloid peptide clearance out of brain. As we can see, almost all the compounds demonstrated potential to activate PGP with exception of compound number nine. The compound number three was the compound which activated uh, PGP the most. 
To conclude, our work was divided in two major parts. The synthesis part, where 10 compounds were successfully synthesized and purified, and according to structural elucidation, they correspond to the established structures. And after the synthesis, the compounds were evaluated using differentiated SH, SY, 5Y cells. The compounds 2, 7, and 8 were the most promising ones against iron-induced cytotoxicity. And the presence of halogen seems to be benefic for this, uh, for this effect. The compounds 3 and 4 demonstrated its slight but, protect, but effective uh, protection against MPP plus induced cytotoxicity, but no correlation between their structure was possible to make. And all the compounds, except compound number nine, demonstrated potential for uh, PGP activation, and then was identified as a PGP inhibitor. With these results, we can affirm that uh, beta amyloid peptide clearance through PGP should not be compromised and can be possibly enhanced using the PGP activators. With this work, a small library of compounds with potential neuroprotective properties against RNN and MPP plus induced cytotoxicity was obtained. In the future, a neuroprotection assays against beta amyloid peptide and evaluation of the effect of compounds on base 1 and GSK3 beta will be conduced. To finish, I would like to acknowledge all the financial entities and um, especially to Simar for my BYT Plus uh, scholarship. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank my supervisors, Dr. Emilia Souza and Dr. Renata Silva, for all the support, uh, for all the support and the uh, 12 people involved in this project. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marcia, for your work. Nice work. Um, I think uh, we don't have any question. I can see any question, but I have one question. Um, I don't know if you are in the beginning of the work, but why to, to study the neuroprotective properties? Why you use it only that cell lines and not, uh, you didn't try to use uh, other cells? Or are you going to use to study these uh, properties? Or? Uh, my, this project is only for one year because I'm in the oh. ma master, so it's the, the time is very reduced. So for now, we will only study this uh, cell line, but in the future, <laughs> it will be interesting now to study yes. uh, other cells. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we can uh, move on for the next presentation. Is um, uh, Lara, Lara Fidalgo from uh, Faculdade de Farmácia uh, from Universidade de Lisboa, and she will present the work Novel Necroptosis Inhibitors Targeting R um, RIP K1. I don't know if I'm <laughs> I'm saying this well, but yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let you me can see. start. Okay, you okay. Want. Okay. Let, let me just try to. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I'll start. Thank you for the introduction. As uh, it was mentioned, my name is Lara, and today I'll be presenting some of my PhD work that I'm developing at uh, Faculdade de Farmácia in Lisboa. So today I'll be presenting the work I've been developing regarding the uh, novel necroptosis inhibitors targeting HIPK1. So first I'll give a brief introduction to the why and how this project started. Necroptosis, a regulated form of necrosis, is the major mechanism of cell death upon extracellular inflammatory signaling and is crucially dependent on the activity of RIPK1 and its downstream mediators, RIPK3 and pseudokinase MLKL. Um, therefore, RIPK1 has emerged as a promising therapeutic target for a wide range of human neurogenerative, autoimmune, and inflammatory diseases. Here we can see the first RIPK1, the first chemical RIPK1 inhibitor identified, necrostatin 1, uh, which was identified through a phenotypical screening of small molecules, followed by NEC1S, which 
presents higher specificity than NEC1, excellent blood-brain barrier permeability, but uh, poor pharmacokinetics, uh, unacceptable oral availability, but poor half-life in vivo. And this warranted the needs to find improved RIPK1 inhibitors. And with this in mind, several other RIPK1 and RIPK3 inhibitors are being studied, namely the inhibitor GSK2982772 inhibitor, which is a potent and selective non-blood-brain barrier permeable inhibitor that targets the same allosteric pocket as NEC1S and was the first RIPK1 inhibitor to enter clinical trials for the treatment of psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and ulcerative colitis. Also, inhibitor DNL747, which is a blood-brain barrier permeable inhibitor, which succeeded at phase one clinical trials for the treatment of, of, of Alzheimer's disease, ALS, sorry, and um, multiple sclerosis. Finally, inhibitor DNL758, which is in preclinical trials for systemic inflammatory diseases. So, um, in order to address the lack of chemotypes in clinical use targeting necroptosis and RIPK1, Ahmed Lisboa has recently um, developed a phenotypic uh, eye throughput screening strategy to identify novel necroptosis inhibitors using an AstraZeneca's compound library. And this work was published just last year. Um, this uh, result led to the identification of promising compounds that possess scaffolds that differed from those reported in the literature. This results combined with computer data drug design techniques led to the identification of the substituted TSOL um, scaffold as uh, promising for RIPK1 inhibition. So having this compiled data in hand, I started working um, on the synthetic route and the first approach that I attempted was a three-step synthetic route that consisted on the synthesis of isothiocyanato benzene from aniline, which was successfully accomplished, followed um, by the thiazole formation, which proved to be more challenging and with different outcomes depending on the cyano source that was being used. And as we can see here, um, I was able to obtain the um, amino substituted um, TSOL analogs at position four of the TSOL ring. And these, uh, these analogs are crucial for introducing stru structural diversity at the central TSOL ring. But um, I couldn't yet obtain the uh, unsubstituted TSOL analogs. And for that, I proceeded to a second approach which consisted of, of a six-step synthetic route that started with a monocondensation of an amide dimethyl acetal uh, with a TO urea that afforded the desired tiazobutadiene intermediate. This was followed by the amine protection that, and, with, and we did not expect this, uh, proved to be more challenging and hardly reproducible under all the conditions tested. So, um, I tried to overcome this uh, setback. And what I did was, since I successfully obtained the tiazobutadiene intermediate, sorry, um, what I did was I tried to um, synthesize the tiazol ring without protecting the amine. And this would also save me two synthetic steps. And for that, um, I tested these reactions under numerous conditions. And I started by using triethylamine as, as the base, using different alpha bromo ketones but I couldn't um, afford, but that uh, those conditions couldn't afford the desired product. So what I did was a base screening. I tested different bases from weaker to stronger. I used DBU, potass potassium terbutoxide, uh, sodium H HMDS, um, sodium hydride, and uh, I could finally obtain for different bromo ketones um, the desired product. And I could also establish a correlation between the bases used and the um, electron withdrawing or electron donating groups at alpha bromo ketone, the R1 um, substituents. So the next step consisted of introducing the uh, structural diversity at the R2 position. And for that, I performed several buchwald artwig reactions. I tested numerous conditions. I tested different substrates, but I could not identify the um, desired product. 
So um, I moved on to a final approach, as you can see here was the final approach because was the one that uh, succeeded until the end. And that approach consisted again of a three-step synthetic route. And this time um, what uh, I attempted was, what if I introduced the uh, R2 chemical diversity at the beginning of the synthesis instead of at the end, as I was doing before with the book for art week. So for that, I performed a monocondensation of an amide dimethyl acetal with a substituted TO urea that successfully afforded me the desired substituted Tiazobutadien. And following that, um, to obtain the Tiazol ring, I used different alpha bromo ketones with different R2 substituents, and I screened different bases, and I could successfully uh, obtain the desired analogs. Finally, the uh, alkylation a reaction, which was straightforward. I used different alkylating um, agents. And um, we are now uh, finalizing the full characterization of these um, analogs. And what we've been um, observing, and we're um, hoping to confirm that, is that depending on the R2 substituent that we're using here, um, we're going to obtain either uh, basically only one main product or more than one product in different proportions. And those products um, will uh, be the result of alkylation of these secondary am amine, amine or alkylation of these uh, tertiary amine. So we're now um, doing that final characterization because these products will have the same exact mass. And regarding um, the NMR proton uh, spectra, for example, they have um, the same multiplicity, just uh, some um, small uh, changes on the um, differences, actually, on the um, shifts. So this will take some extra time to identify which um, analog is which. Um, but this was my successful um, approach. Finally, this um, synthesized library will now enter a in vitro screening for um, anti-necroplotic activity and ability to modulate uh, RIPK1's activity, allowing to establish a solid structure activity relationship and unveil the structural features that control potency and selectivity towards RIPK1. Also, the SAR, also additional SAR-based li li libraries uh, will be um, synthesized and uh, screened for their in vitro um, activity in an interactive way until a small set of potent and selective inhibitors is identified. Um, I would now like to thank the 7th FICAM organization for allowing me to present my work, also FCT for my PhD grant funding, my supervisors, Professor Ana Ressurreição, Professor Rui Moreira and Professor Cecilia Rodrigues, my PhD and lab colleagues, and finally, all of you for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. Thank you for your presentation and your work. Uh, I'm not seeing any question. Um, it's just a curiosity. Uh, you said that uh, you are going to do uh, in vitro uh, studies and uh, how about uh, uh, in vivo? Are you thinking about uh, doing this or? Yes, yes. Um, in vivo studies are actually in my initial PhD um, uh, plan, but uh, we'll have to see uh, depending on the in vitro results. Um, and if everything goes well, that's what I hope for. Um, I could proceed for the in vivo studies. That's, that's what I would like, but um, I have limited time, of course. So let's see. I, hopefully it will happen, but let's see. <laughs> yes, I hope to. Thank yeah, you, Lara. Thank, thank you again. Um, the next presentation is from João Manuel Ravasco, uh, also from uh, IMED, from Faculdade de Farmácia da Universidade de Lisboa. Uh, and the work is entitled Predict multivariate models for bioorthogonal inverse electron demand deals all the reactions. You can start whatever you want. Thank you so much. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. And can you see my mouse as well? Yes. Okay, perfect. 
So thank you so much for, for the opportunity to present here for you today. Uh, my name is Joel. Uh, I'm going to present you a kind of an abstract uh, work. I think it's very different from everything that's been uh, presented here today. So if, any questions that you have, the simple that you may think it, it may be, please uh, ask at the end. So I'm going to present you uh, multivariate models to predict reactivity, namely in the Alder reaction. And this Diels-Alder reaction uh, is very popular because of the boom that biorthogonal chemistry has, uh, has seen in the last 20 years. Biorthogonal chemistry uh, has been coined by Carolyn Bertozzi, who should win the Nobel Prize someday. Uh, and it basically is just any type of reaction that may occur in biological media without disturbing uh, any of the native, uh, native mechanistical pathways. And for, uh, since you, you, as you may imagine, for, for it to react in biological media, it has to be biocompatible and very, very fast and selective toward each other. And in this sense, we highlight two of them. The uh, cyclizations are very important for this type of chemistry. And the first electron demand deals older uh, is one of the fastest and the more robust that have been reported so far. And in these graphs, you can see that reactivity at 110 uh, micromolar uh, is very, very affected by, uh, by second order constants, by, react, uh, by, by molecular constants. And if you take, for instance, one hour reaction under these concentrations, if you, if you have one molar uh, per second type of reaction, it's only around 20%. Uh, but if you go to 1,000, it's almost 100% at one hour. So reactivity really dictates uh, how, uh, how powerful and uh, efficient these type of reactions will be when you go to in vivo. And this has been done. This has been done to release drugs for radio labeling and uh, uh, has, been, has been having a boom since the last 20 years. Uh, but it's very challenging and it's very time consuming to, to develop new regions that are more efficient because they uh, also have to be stable. And this is all based on iterative development uh, uh, in a synthetical point of view. Uh, so predicting reactivity and uh, from a region that you have no experience and you, you don't uh, have in hand synthetically is very important for you to, to minimize your efforts. And the, the bioorthogonal toolbox regarding reverse electron demand solder has been very, very expanded in the past few years, ranging from cyclopropene. Uh, tetrazines are almost always there, but the dionophile has been seeing a lot of diversity, ranging from transcyclooctanes with almost, uh, with, it, it goes to uh, 500,000 molar, uh, molar per second reactivity. They are very, very fast. And this has allowed very recently uh, for the ty this type of scaffolds to enter uh, clinical trials and go first to humans. So this is a very big advance for, chemi for chemical biology and biotechnology chemistry. Uh, however, if you want to predict reactivity, uh, usually you are dependent on the, F the FT study, either by calculation of transition state or transition state energies and by, or by distortion interaction models that, that have been described by AUK and co-workers who have done an splendid job in the, in the past decades uh, in this type of reactions. So you, you may imagine that if you want to try and cross uh, some, react uh, some reactions to see if they are compatible with each other, you have to calculate transition states for every one of these uh, from these pairs. So uh, if you have a 10 by 10, well, you have to uh, calculate 100 transition states. And this demands, it's very time consuming, even if you are proficient in DFT calculations and demands for higher computational power. So what we envisioned was to hijack this uh, uh, in the electron in reverse uh, toolbox and just parameterize individually each of the regions by and just take out the geometrical and electronical uh, aspect of it, such as angles, uh, regular angle angles, diagonal angles, um, size of the substituents, and we just have a linear free energy relationship uh, from uh, that uses these multivariate parameters from individual regions. And this is it's like a XR curve, a XR, a XR equation, if you want, and. It has very good predictive, uh, predictive skills to, to predict reactivity. So if you take 
uh, for instance, the transacoctin pathogen reaction, we just, as I said, we just individually optimized uh, uh, every region that is in the literature uh, and then applied uh, an algorithm. Uh, it's, you can classify that as a machine learning algorithm, but it's a very simple one. It's just multilinear regression. And you end up with an equation, like I said, that quantifies, for instance, the NBL charge in its, uh, in its own position, the, the size of the substituent distance between two atoms that you can see are this one. And you can even uh, create some charts for it. And this is, uh, you can see that most of this uh, reactivity comes from the, uh, from the tetrazine. And if you have this class of, of transactor opting, they are very difficult to modify in terms of reactivity. And most modulation comes from the tetrazine. And this is only an, uh, an example, but you can do this for every class of dianophile that you have so far. Uh, and it's very interesting that you can see that they are uh, reactivity uh, kind of shifts depend, uh, depending on the dianophile that you are using. Uh, and more interestingly, you can just put them all together. For instance, you can see here that uh, in one single equation, which is this one, you can predict reactivity of all linear alkenes. And this is very interesting because you see in very uh, in different uh, grayscales, this is the error associated. And you can ha either have some, some predictions that we perform. And you, as, you, as you can see, uh, uh, these ones are extreme outliers because they differ in a, mechani in a, mechanistically, uh, in a mechanistically way because they contain boron that coordinates with this type of pyridines. And this accelerates the reaction. And this is not, uh, this uh, is not contemplated in our uh, in our model, and it's very interesting because it can identify also mechanistic outliers. But if you go to the general uh, to the regular points, you have very uh, very small e uh, energetic errors associated with it. And we went the further step, the further step, and we designed an holistic model. And this one contains around 310 reactions, and you can act, you can predict uh, every by orthogonal reaction using the inverse electron demand Bill Zalder that it is, exists so far. Well, at the point where we published the paper. Uh, but we also, this of course, has to pass several validation methods uh, statistically. Uh, and uh, But it's very interesting that, for instance, we try to predict these ones. These ones are novel regions. These ones are were not included in our data set because you have a training set to to train the algorithm, and then you have a validation set to see if the well, if the algorithm and your answer is robust. And we try to predict this one, uh, and our equation uh, just went very accurately within uh, one kilocalorie per mole uh, of error. Uh, and as you can see, uh, using all reactions from the literature. Uh, there's a lot of diversity uh, and, um, and points of functionalization and tunability that comes from the from the dyne that are these blue dots because uh, these, blue, uh, these blue parameters are from the dyne. They are much more important than the, from the tetrazine. And very importantly, these ones here are not, none of them are electronical. And if you know the deals all the reaction, you know that the homo, uh, homo gap is very important. But correlation, there's a correlation between these geometric parameters and the electronical ones, and our machine learning algorithm just uh, to, uh, to reach this one as the most important, the most important one. So in the end, we param parameterized structures from uh, di several dianophiles and dienes. We contemplated more than 300 uh, uh, reactions from the literature, more than 2,000 regions, and generated a data-driven approach to predict second-order constants in only inverse electron demand Diels alder reactions. These are very statistically robust. They have very good predictive skills and are chemical comprehensive. What I mean from chemical comprehensive is that this is not a black box that you usually associate with machine learning. You know what these angles are. You know that these angles means ring strain because this angle, this angle is this one. And you know this is the distance between two carbons. And when you optimize your your scaffold computationally, you can predict and tune it uh, before going to, to the bench to get the best results. And currently we are developing, of course, complementary models that are in the submission and identify two new, new regions. One of them is already starting in vivo assays. So thank you 
all uh, for allowing me to present you this part of my work today. Uh, I'd like, of course, to thank FCT for funding and my wonderful group at uh, FFWell at IMED, the Bioorganical uh, Group, and of course, Jaime, uh, who was a postdoc at uh, Berkeley and uh, with Matthew Siegman, who used this type of multivariate models and taught it to me and my supervisor, of course, Professor Galsafons, who allowed me such uh, to have such uh, diverse chemical experiment. Thank you all. Thank you, João, for your interesting work and your presentation. Um, when I read your abstract, I, I, I had a, a, a doubt, a curiosity about the applications of these, uh, these models. And uh, I saw in your presentation that uh, you said uh, therapy and labeling, I think, if I'm not wrong. Do you think um, that uh, there's others uh, besides these ones? You you have others appli uh, application areas to to use this uh, this methodology? Yes, indeed. Uh, our methodology uh, only aims to predict uh, chemical reactivity, and this is interesting. Was interesting for us because chemical reactivity of this type of reactions is what is holding application. So you want very high reactivity if you want to go to in vivo. So our model was, de was developed towards that. But uh, yes, uh, the drug delivery, because then the dynamics of the applications are, 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 more, are also dependent on what your biophilonal pair can do. So if you have a reaction that results in the cleavage of a bond, it can be used to release a drug. And that's what's uh, on clinical trial, trials right now. But it can be used to to in polymerization. It can be used. It's very transversal to several types of, of chemical areas. Yeah. Yes, in material science. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Your... My pleasure. Okay, so uh, we uh, move forward for the the last presentation of today is um, uh, Ana Lucia Pinto from uh, Faculdade de Ciências e Tecnologia from Univer uh, Universidade Nova de Lisboa with the, um, the presentation entitled Disensitized Solar Cells from Wine Pigments. Yes, hi, thank you, Joana. So hi. can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, now yes. yes. And yes. the pointer? Okay. Yes. <laughs> so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ana Lucia. And I am a PhD student uh, in sustainable chemistry uh, from Nova University. Um, and I belong to the group of uh, Tiago Moreira, CHARM, the one that was presented uh, earlier this afternoon. And I am going to present our work in the development of new synthetic paranoflavillium salts inspired in red wine colorants for disensitized solar cell application. So, Disensitized solar cells are photovoltaic devices that uh, mimic photosynthesis using molecular dyes adsorbed to an oxide semiconductor to produce electrical energy from light harvesting. So to assemble one of uh, these cells, you need um, a semiconductor oxide layer, usually titanium dioxide, a dye sensitizer adsorbed to this uh, film, an electrolyte solution with a redox couple, and finally a counter electrode with a, cast, a catalyst. So as my title already uh, spoiled, our work focuses on optimizing the dye sensitizer targeting anthocyanins. Anthocyanins are the pigments responsible for the wonderful variety of blue to red colors uh, found in nature in most fruits and flowers. So the first disensitized solar cell using natural anthocyanins was reported in 1997 and achieved an efficiency of 0.56% for cyanidine uh, tree glucoside extracted from blackberries. So in fact, some natural compounds can efficiently anchor to titanium dioxide. However, they do not possess the donor acceptor pattern optimized for electron injection. So in our group, uh, we develop a series of bio-inspired synthetic flavillion compounds optimized for solar cell application. So as you can see with some minor structural changes, we were able to achieve an efficiency of 3% with this compound. 
still an important question remaining for us. So could these results be further improved if we used a different anchoring unit? And uh, this question imposes itself, not only because the best performing dyes based on ruthenium complexes use carboxylate units to anchor to the oxide, but also because when considering a naturally occurring dyes, beta lanes usually display higher efficiencies as was shown in this study. So like anthocyanins, beta lanes are antioxidant compounds that absorb light in the visible region, but conversely to beta lanes, uh, to anthocyanins, sorry, beta lanes have carboxylate uh, units to anchor to titanium dioxide. So consequently, these higher efficiencies are often attributed to stronger electronic coupling and the faster electron injection due to this carboxylate uh, anchorage. So to answer to this question, we focused our attention on red wine, not on drinking it, but to use it as a source of inspiration by study pyranoanthocyanins, which are the compounds responsible for the characteristic uh, burgundy color of red wine. So pyranoanthocyanins arise from the transformation of the anthocyanins present in young red wines during wine uh, aging and maturation. They display higher color intensity and are stable over a wider range um, of pH when compared to their anthocyanin precursors. So this makes them interesting candidates for energy applications. So in partnership with the group of Professor Vitor uh, Freitas, who will present tomorrow, we developed a series of bio-inspired uh, paranoflavillium compounds to study the impact of structural modifications, such as precisely the anchoring units. So we have compounds that have both anchoring units. We have one compound, compound D, which only um, has carboxylic units, and we have compounds that can only anchor through catechol units. So the first thing we noticed was that the adsorption was quite effective regardless of the anchoring unit. So as you can see by the spectra and by this picture here that shows our uh, compounds adsorbed to a thin film of titanium dioxide. Uh, however, the cell results revealed the real impact of using these different uh, linkers. So as you can see, compound D, the one with the two carboxylic units, is also the one with the lowest photovoltage and photocurrent density results. Um, with an efficiency of 0.03%. When we decrease the amount of carboxylic acids until we reach compounds B and F, which have no carboxylic acids, we reach the highest photocurrent density and photovoltage results and the highest efficiency. So we were able to conclude that the cell performance was highly dependent on the nature of the linker unit. Furthermore, the presence of carboxylic groups contributes to lower all cell parameters. And this was a major uh, result in, the, in this field because to understand that in this family of compounds, the presence of electron withdrawing um, uh, carboxylic units seem to have a deleterious effect on electron injection. We were able to demystify this preconized idea that an efficient sensitizer for disensitized solar cell must anchor through carboxylate. So as you can see in this case, the presence of this carboxylic unit results in a zwitterionic uh, species with a conjugation confined in the anchoring area. While for catechol, upon anchoring, we have a truly neutral species through quinone formation, which allows for the charge to be completely, uh, completely delocalized through the whole molecule, like a highway of electrons, thus favoring uh, electron injection into the titanium dioxide. This effect can be further improved if we implement a strong electron donor uh, in this position, so which leads me to the next part of our work. Using the same pattern of fluvium core, we modified uh, the structure, now adding a strong uh, electron donor, extending pi conjugation, extending the highway, and finally, uh, ignoring completely carboxylate uh, units, we chose different anchoring units. So we have catechol for cyanidine derivatives. We have 4 prime OH flanked by two methoxy units for malvidin derivatives. And we have one compound with no ring B substitution for comparison. So we found that increasing pi conjugation not only affects the molecule's color and flexibility, but also affects the acidity of the ammonium proton. So we verify that along with pi conjugation extension, an increase in pKa1 uh, corresponding to the deprotonation of the dimethyl ammonium group was verified. 
along with this PKA increase, an efficiency decrease was verified. So as you can see, we reached our highest efficiency, 2.57% uh, for compounds JO3, the one with the direct CC bond between the pyranocore and the dimethylamino group. So this led us to conclude two things. First of all, the importance of the enrollment of the amino electron pair in conjugation to increase photocurrent density and photovoltage, and consequently the, effic the efficiency of the cell. And second, the importance of having less flexible structures in order to avoid energy losses. One last thing I would like to show you concerns the importance of the pH of the solution media for this compound. So paranoantocyanins like anthocyanins are extremely sensitive to pH changes and that reflected on diadsorption as you can see. So what you see in here are films resulting from adsorption from ethanolic and acidified uh, ethanol solutions uh, highlighted in darker backgrounds. So as you can see, especially for malvidin derivatives, the resulting films, uh, according to the pH of the media, have strikingly different colors. So what's happening in solution is that the predominant species in ethanolic solutions are AH plus and A forms, the quinoidal uh, base, this one, which can be identified by this blue color you see in the solution. Upon media acidification, the equilibrium starts to shift towards the formation of the fully protonated species, which can be identified to this red color. So as you can guess, uh, our final solutions are um, a mixture of uh, all these species. So going back to our uh, films again, for ethanolic solutions, uh, we have blue films corresponding to anchorage through one or more of the available uh, OH groups Thus, we are promoting anchoring by the quinoidal base, as is usually the case for this type of compounds. Upon acidification, we start to promote anchorage through the amine, as you can see by the appearance of the red color. So for cyanidine derivatives, we have a mixture of both types of anchoring. We have films that are simultaneously blue and red. I think you can see the colors. Uh, so for malvidin derivatives, however, we go from a completely blue to a completely red film. This is a striking difference. So we speculated that in malvidin derivatives, the presence of these metoxy units flanking the 4'OH prime can sterically hinder the complexation to titanium dioxide, thus favoring in acidic media anchoring through the dimethylamine group. So we found uh, a way to modulate titanium dioxide anchorage through medium acidification. So just to summarize, uh, when designing dyes for disensitized solar cell applications, if you ever get to that point in your life, besides all the well-known rules, the, the well-established rules, please bear in mind to always find the best anchoring unit for your compound guarantee electron enrollment uh, of your electron donor, okay, in conjugation to increase cell efficiency and avoid flexible structures or any other kind of competitive pathway that might lead to energy losses. So let me finish by thanking all the many people uh, involved in this work, the committee for giving me this opportunity, SCP for funding, and of course, all of you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Nice work and presentation. Um, uh, I have one question for you uh, because I, uh, I don't see any questions, so I, I can make one. Um, in, of course, in, a, in the future, uh, comparing the, these synthesizer uh, solar cells with the conventional ones, do you think that uh, um, they are cost effective. So we're still a long, a long way from yeah, those cells, those think. commercial cells. But yes, they are um, cost effective. They are really cheap to produce. And if you go to towards these um, sustainable, eco-friendly dyes, for example, our dyes, okay, this is our uh, simple synthesis strategies, okay, and even if you extract directly from natural uh, resources or from, from pumice of uh, wine production, for example, this can be really cost effective. The thing is, you, you, we still have a long way 
uh, to optimize this to compete um, with what we have in the market today. Yes. A long way. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Good work. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you for the for your presentation, Anna, and for all the, the speakers from this uh, section. Um, now I think uh, we can uh, move to the organizers. I don't know. Ines? Yes. yes. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you were saying, Joana, thank you for uh, all the very interesting uh, oral communications and also Thank you to Dr. Alvaro Goyanes for the very interesting talk and the, the remaining um, communicators that we had here this, this uh, afternoon. All the works were very, very interesting and uh, we hope that um, this uh, day was fruitful for many people to, to, to know the work of other people and now to get in contact with them to get uh, to do networking and um, probably arrange, I don't know, some fruitful collaborations in the future. So thank you so much also for the chairs, Joana and Professor Beatriz. Thank you so much, so much for your participation. And we think we can close for today and we see tomorrow morning uh, by 9.15 with uh, Dr. Paulo Ferreira for the plenary speaker and we see you tomorrow. Thank you so much all, bye. Bye.